good evening guys uh, welcome to another edition of smart talk this one is titled um, see better not harder and i promise you it's going to be a great one amongst our panelists today we have dr shrinivas desai head of radio imaging at jaslok hospital and research center mumbai we have dr aparna patankar who is a consultant radiologist with a keen interest in abdominal anatomy at global hospitals uh, also from mumbai uh, joining us from uh, all across Uh, in the US is Dr. Charlotte Coort. She is an assistant professor of surgery at uh, Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Um, our last panelist, but uh, definitely not the least, is Dr. B. Ramana. He is head of uh, minimal access surgery department at CMRI, Calcutta. Our first uh, speaker for the evening is uh, Dr. Shubhra Roy Chaudhary. He is a consultant radiologist at R. N. Tagore Hospital, uh, Calcutta. Uh, Oh yeah, Doctor Desai has just joined in. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, moderating hi. the event are going to be me. I'm Ahm Arora from Grand Medical College and Surgery Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. And along with me, I have Doctor Harsh Sheet. He is a consultant uh, laparoscopic and GI surgeon at Safi and Walkart Hospitals, uh, Mumbai. Um, so over to you, Doctor Shubhra Chaudhary. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Right. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, you guys can see me and hear me. Can you see my screen, all right? Yes, everything. Lovely. Okay, so uh, uh, Ramana is a good friend, and I've shared the screen previously with uh, not the screen, sorry, the stage previously with uh, Eric, and I, I. I know that there are you know uh, there are two radiologists in the panel. I can assure you that there is a third, and I'm not kidding. and that is eric polly and it's a, it's a real pleasure to have him as a you know as a co panelist as a co speaker um you know sometimes there there's a lot to learn from each other the first time i did share a stage with him i learned many times more than uh, than anybody else learned on that day so it's it's a real privilege and it's also a privilege to be uh, talking to a group of Surgeons who have got such keen interest on the uh, in the anterior abdominal wall. So Ram asked me to speak on MRI of the abdominal wall. At the outset, I would like to just say that the mainstay of of hernia imaging in terms of assessing a patient, etc., is done with CT rather than MR. MR does offer certain advantages, <laughs> and I would like to point those out today. Uh, and then maybe just touch a little bit about intervention related to the anterior abdominal wall. So. <clears throat> so you know there has been a paradigm shift in the management of complex ventral hernias with multiple recent and by recent i mean the last 15 years of technical advances in the repair technique uh, a ct is the mainstay of imaging and i think we are going to hear from dr polly on this and i'm not going to talk at all on ct although there would be some ct images for inevitable reasons because it is the mainstay uh, mr and ultrasound can be used as an alternative in selected cases of course for superior contrast resolution and the fact that it is non radiating however mr and its signal characteristics are often often an anathema to surgeons so ram specifically asked me to spend 5 to 10 minutes of this talk on talking on very basic stuff about mr and mr signal characteristics if it is insulting to some people then i apologize at the outset because this is going to be very very basic and this is something that we do a, a number of talks on when we talk to non radiological specialties so why mri the the main advantage of mr is obviously it is able to diagnose tissue characterize tissue in terms of fat blood collagen fibrosis calcification with high soft tissue contrast resolution it is sort of tissue typing it is sort of pseudo histology so we can also assess the aggressiveness of a lesion with diffusion weighted imaging it's a it's like a pseudo pet if you if you know what i mean if we add contrast in terms of gadolinium it improves the contrast resolution and various other things that i will go over now before we start i think this is the very very basic stuff so we talk about these 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 words t1 weighted imaging t2 weighted imaging t1 fat suppressed imaging or stir imaging i'm just going to concentrate on these four now if you look at these four these are the four basic techniques that we use to tissue type on mri 
So when you talk about T1 weighted imaging, I won't talk about how the magnetic transfer happens and how a T1 or T2 weighted imaging is, image is generated. But basically, if you look at T1 weighted imaging, suppose you are the end user, you're not manufacturing the image, you're the end user reading the image, then the things that you need to be aware of are these. At a T1 weighted image, fat is bright. I mean, bright, bright. Blood is bright, often not as bright as fat. Melanin is sort of bright. Proteinaceous fluid can be bright. Muscle is iso intense. Fluid is dark. Calcium is dark. Hair is dark. Now, the way I have colored these, these words is based on the brightness of what you see on MRI. So something that is bright white is, is, is the font is in white and something that is dark, the font is in black. On T2 weighted imaging, fluid or pathology is bright. Fat is also bright, but not as bright as in T1. Acute blood can be, hyperacute blood can be bright, but most often it is not, it is dark or intermediate. Muscle is intermediate, but slightly more than that in T1. Collagen is dark, old blood is dark, calcium is dark and air is dark. Now, so essentially the basic difference between T1 and T2 weighted imaging, and I will show this by pictures in a second. I think the top picture that you can see there is a, is a T1 weighted image, but we'll talk about that in a second. The essential difference is fat is very bright in T1 weighted image, fluid is dark. T2 weighted image, fluid is bright, fat is also bright, blood is dark most of the time. Now, if I look at T1 fat suppressed image and by fat suppression, I mean that we are actually putting a selective inversion pulse to selectively negate the signal coming from fat. So it is a T1 weighted sequence, but we are negating the signal from fat. So then of course, fat is dark, but blood melanin and proteinaceous fluid remain bright. But normal fluid is still dark. And that is the basic difference between T1 fat suppressed image and a stir image. A classic stir image is where fluid remains bright and fat is suppressed to make it dark. Now I know that I've used these words kind of, uh, you know, too much, but just to explain the same thing with pictures. Now, suppose we are trying to image the lower abdomen or pelvis, let's say. So what are the main sequences you would do? I typically would start and I'm not talking of the upper abdomen here. I'm talking about the lower abdomen, umbilicus and below. So I would start with the T2 sagittal. So this is a T2 sagittal sequence. And let's have a look at this. I, I have not got my arrow, sorry. But you can see the urinary bladder to be bright because fluid is bright. You can see muscle. Uh, you can see the fat within the marrow of the sacrum is intermediate to slightly bright. The interdiscal space, the disc spaces are dark. The muscle, the anterior abdominal wall, the linea alba or below the, you know, below the umbilicus, there's no linea alba, but you can see the, the fibrous tissue as dark. The interabdominal fat as bright. So this is a T2 weighted image. Now, sorry, oops, let me use the voice. Okay, the thing is protruding on. Let me just get it. Okay. Just one second, guys. So let me just escape from this. So, um, one second. So, uh, da, 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 da. okay. So if you look at the movie now, uh, you will see that again, same things. So this is a T2 sagittal, that's what we would start. This is a female, you can see the uterus. You can see a part of the iliopsoas which appears as dark as we come along to the side. We can see the muscles of the, of the back and we'll talk about that potential advantage of MR when we image the anterior abdominal wall. See, this is the gluteus, for example. We know that the gluteus right at the back, uh, I don't know whether you can see my arrow. See, right at the back, see the, the, the intramuscular fat content. Now, this is something that you would see better with MR. So if you're, if you're looking at a muscle, if you're looking at the tone of the muscle or, the, or rather the content of the muscle, the fat content of the muscle, Potentially, MR offers you certain advantages over CT. So the next set of sequences we would have is a T1-weighted sequence. So again, this is a T1-weighted sequence. And you can see here, you can see here that the bladder is, is dark. This is, this is part of the uterus intermediate signal. 
fat within the bone, muscle is intermediate. This is part of the rectum containing air, it is dark. And the rest of the subcutaneous fat is bright. So T1 weighted to it, fat is bright. We'll talk about blood in a second. And let us just have a look at this image. See the, this is a bowel, large bowel, right colon, air fluid level. See the fluid here is slightly bright. This is because of the proteinaceous content of this fluid. That is why it is slightly bright. And note the blood vessels. Sometimes blood vessels on T1 weighted sequences, etc., would have very variable sequence, a very variable signal. And that would depend upon the rate of flow, etc. All right, so that's the point I was trying to make on the movie there is the fact that proteinaceous fluid, as you saw in this particular case, you, you saw that it was actually slightly bright on the, in the bowel. So an interesting point about this, if I just go back, sorry, one second, uh, Ram. So one of the interesting points is if as we come to the, as we come to the lower end of the axial images, sometimes because of partial voluming, you can actually mimic, mimic a hernia. You can actually sometimes see that there appears to be a defect. But this is not actually a defect. If you look at it, multiplanar reconstructions, you would understand that that is actually not a defect. So for example, this is a very recent case. This is a very recent case. As you can see, the circle place where it appears to be a defect. And uh, if you look at the MR, even on the MR, there appears to be there may be a gap there as the, you know, the, the lower end of the rectus sheet inserts into the symphysis. I'll just show you in this corner here. But this is not really a hernia because to identify a hernia, you do need to see a sac. And there wasn't any sac here. And this is the laparoscopy done very, very recently, actually, to, to sort of prove that there was no hernia because there was some clinical doubt about this. So coming to the next basic sequence is a T2 weighted axial sequence. This is, you can call the workhorse sequence for most imaging within the pelvis, uh, whether it is for gynecological indications or for pelvic surgical indications. Uh, again, fluid is bright, okay? And one place where you can assess fluid if you are not having the bladder is the CSF around the, within the spinal canal. And the CSF is bright as you can see here. And then if you come slightly further down, even the fat is bright. And uh, we have been through these, these things, the bladder is, the bladder is bright, obviously. And this is the point that of confusion that I was mentioning to you about. But here on the, you can actually assess, and you can see the extreme clarity with which you can see the pelvic organs. You can see all the muscles, the intermuscular fat planes are much better appreciated on MR than on CT. And there are a few things, for example, I don't know whether you appreciate it as it went through the common femoral vessels and the inferior of the gastric artery, which you can see quite well on MR. And that is a very key landmark when we try to assess a hernia. Then we come to T1 fat suppressed image. And this is not so much applicable to hernia, not so much. Uh, and the main application of that is that it's T1. So fluid, bladder, urine is dark, fat is suppressed, but blood is hyper intense. So, here, for example, you can see an endometriotic cyst with a hydrosulfing on the right side, bilateral endometriotic cyst because they contain blood. These are adnexal structures. They appear bright. So I can tell that this is a fluid, but it is a blood containing structure. So you can distinguish this between a normal serous or mucinous or a, or a, or a, or a you know, a, a, a cyst adenoma to an endometrioma. I can distinguish by the fact that this contains blood and therefore it is likely to be an endometriotic cyst. So similarly in the setting of the anterior abdominal wall, I can give you an example of let's say a rectus sheath hematoma versus a desmoid. If you use a T1 fat suppressed image, then you can distinguish between the fact that it is a rectus sheath hematoma. The next sequence is a stir, a coronal stir. And a coronal stir is actually a very, very useful sequence because the fluid is bright and by definition pathology is bright because pathology contains more fluid, therefore pathological structures are bright. So for example, in a perianal fistula, this is a linear, simple, intersphincteric, uh, simple, uh, you know, uh, intersphincteric fistula tract entering the plane with, uh, with no side extensions or no supralevator extension, no ischial fossa involvement. 
uh, opening internally at the dentate line, opening externally at about you know seven o'clock. So this sort of imaging would be best done by a stir, which you can acquire in the axial and in the coronal plane. So the next bit that I'm going to talk about is diffusion weighted imaging. Uh, Ehan, am I okay? Is that too basic for you guys? Should I continue along these lines? No, absolutely. Okay, I, I sort of mounted. Uh, okay. So the next thing that I want to talk about is, is diffusion weighted imaging. And diffusion weighted imaging is an anathema to a lot of people. And I just want to explain the very basic concept of DWI. So what DWI means is just look at the left hand side picture. This, these are pictures of some cells and some water molecules. The so water molecules are the blue dots, which are in Brownian motions, Brownian motion as indicated by the zigzag lines. And the black circles are the cells. So if you think about a normal acellular structure, a normal water molecule is in free Brownian motion, which means it is unrestricted in its motion. As the cellularity increases, as you see on the right hand side pictures, the, there is increasing restriction of the water molecules, correct? So when you get more pathological tissue, for example, the cancer or even an abscess, where you've got increased cellularity, you have reduced excursion of the Brownian motion of the water molecules. So therefore you have got increasing restriction. So basically what we are imaging here is the increased restriction of water molecules. How do we do that? So if we have a B0, which is the top left image, which means it is the same as a T2 weighted imaging, there is unrestricted diffusion. So there is, there is no diffusion gradient that is applied. So it is the same as a normal T2 weighted imaging. So therefore bladder is dark, uh, sorry, bladder is bright. The fluid in the bladder is bright. As I increase the diffusion gradient to 500 to 1000, I am increasingly seeing the bladder becoming darker, means that normal fluid is becoming darker. But if it was a pathological tissue, that would have got brighter. So a cancer would have got brighter as I went from B0 to B1000. And that would be mimicked by, on the ADC map, as that area appearing darker as black. So cut a long story short, a pathological tissue, a cancer, an abscess, will become less bright as we increase the B value from zero to thousand. And on the ADC map, it would appear as a dark black spot, dark black area. So this is the concept of diffusion. So then the next concept of course is gadolinium. So contrast enhancement and gadolinium. So you can see, sorry, the, the, there is a bit of flare on the, when I took the pictures, but basically you can have various phases. As you know, you can have an arterial phase, a venous phase. So the top right image is a non-contrast image. The, the bottom left is an arterial phase and the bottom right is a, sorry, one second, let me charge. And the bottom right is a portal venous phase image. All I'm trying to show to you is that the arteries are seen as bright as you can see of the iliac arteries on the bottom left. And then uh, this image is very flared, so it's not a fair representation really. So that having covered the basics of MR and signal intensity, I'm sorry if I've bored some people, particularly SBD and uh, you know Eric, I'm sure has been bored to death. So uh, the next bit that I'm just going to briefly speak about is the anteroabdominal wall. And this is something that you guys, I don't need to talk about, but all I wanted to, because the you know, there's a CT picture on the left because we do, we do talk about the rectus sheath, the external oblique, the internal oblique, the transverse abdominis, uh, you know, the fat plane between the two obliques and the transverse abdominis, the little bit of latissimus dorsi, the erector spiny, the quadratus lumborum, they're all marked. Uh, obviously, the lumbar triangle, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you can see all of that on MR. So if I just, I don't know whether I can escape, but if I can just put my arrow, if I can convince you that the, inter the intermuscular fat plane between the two obliques and the transverses is probably better seen on MR. And therefore, when you do a component repair or something like that, when you're going to actually calculate your muscle bulk, for example, you know, I know that you, got, you guys have got maths, various sorts of maths to do these. 
you know, uh, when you try to do separation and stuff like that, the, the, the assessment of the bulk, the volume, the content, the quality, how fat, how much fat there is in this muscle. Is it a good contractile muscle? Is it a more atrophic muscle? I think that sort of distinction may be slightly better on MR. I don't know whether Eric agrees, but I, this, this may be slightly better on MR. Uh, and, and, <coughs> and little things like the properitoneal fat line, for example, you know, the properitoneal, this, this line here, which I have marked with these little yellow, yellow arrows, you, you can see this on CT, you can, but sometimes it is better appreciated on MR. I'm not trying to recommend to you that you should routinely use MR for assessing your hernia preoperatively. I'm not trying to say that. But if you are getting an MR, then it can adequately serve your purpose. It can depict the exact anatomy that you see on CT. And it, it may have certain, certain advantages. And this is where I actually you know, should stop because I think you're going to hear about this much more in the following talk. You know, you know the, the various types of the location of the meshes. Meshes can be classified by the generation of it, first, second, third generation. It can be classified according to the product, how it is made in terms of polypropylene to biologic, etc. And I'm no expert on that. And I, I'm sure we will hear much more about this. Radiologically speaking, I think it's very important to understand that mesh can be classified into four types. It can be visible. It can be inaccurately visible, it can be indirectly visible, or it can be invisible. And here, I'm sure Eric will show some beautiful pictures of how you can infer about the location of the mesh. And that is the lesson that I learned when I, when, when, when I saw his talk the other time. So, so that is something that is a wonderful thing to, to understand as radiologists. So I'm not going to talk about this. But this is something that you can easily reference to, I think, when we do report on hernias and you know, people like Ram would always tell us that what sort of mesh has been used. So we have a reference, but you know, this is not something that we memorize, but we can actually refer to these sort of charts and we can say that, you know, how are we expected to see this on CT or MR? Is it going to be visible, not visible, inferable, etc.? So this is something that you can refer to. Of course, a mesh appears oftentimes as an, as an dark, because, because of the fibrosis associated with it. When there is a meshoma, the, the, the surrounding fibrosis, of course, enhances, as you can see on the bottom right image, that there is an enhancement of that. This is not necessarily pathological enhancement because this is something that you would see at about two to four weeks onwards because of the associated fibrosis and enhancement. But typically the left-hand image is a bilateral inguinal hernia repair and you can see the mesh and that is, that is how it would appear as a hypo-intense wavy, oftentimes wavy uh, uh, structure that is not a normal structure. And, and the, uh, this is not, I'm, going to, I'm not going to talk about that, the, the concept of, you know, various releases and, you know, the way that you assess, assess the muscle in CT, I guess you can assess the same on MR. I am no expert on this. In terms of loss of domain, in terms of the ratio of the hernia volume to the residual abdominal cavity volume, and this is something that we do on CT, but I guess if push comes to shove, we can do this on MR. You know, this is the sort of thing that we do. And uh, basic volume segmentation, uh, those of us who do oncological imaging and we have segmentation softwares, we can use our, our liver volume softwares. We can use those to give you exact volumes of, of, of the content versus the abdominal cavity and the ratio. And, you know, you know that what numbers to use. The principle being just for the non-surgeons, the principle being that forceful return may cause respiratory distress or abdominal compartment syndrome, of course. So uh, this talk is not about, you know, we, we, uh, Srinivas, I'm sure, can give a fantastic talk, and so can I, and I'm sure Aparna can, uh, on, on, on exquisite pictures of beautiful hernias that we have spotted throughout our careers at various, various hernias. So this talk is not about the esoteric. I'm not going to talk about the esoteric you know, spigelian and the, and the obturators and, you know, the obstructed obturators, etc. But, you know, these are the various hernias that, that you can spot on image. And Im imaging, particularly CT, is absolutely fantastic, particularly in the acute, obstructed, strangulated, incarcerated setting. But this is one place where MR, I'm going to talk about now for the next five minutes or so, is actually invaluable. 
and and that is the you know the the inguinal canal and however much we think we know this well uh, you know it is not so easy to translate the anatomy to imaging believe you me and i will show you that by examples you know this bit we all know right the the inguinal canal the deep ring then the superficial ring which you can't see uh, both of which you can infer you can see the external iliac vessel the common femoral vessel you can see the inferior epigastric artery and thereby the inguinal triangle and thereby the the di distinction between a direct uh, you know a direct hernial sac and indirect hernial sac and of course the femoral hernial sac where it comes down along the medial femoral canal medial to the femoral vein as marked on my slide here so this bit we all know the surgical picture i would just like to show tell you one thing that the the inferior epigastric vessels are very well seen on coronal as well as on axial image and uh, the the right hand image is a little bit of a war zone but uh, i think if you go down from the right hand column number 2 is the inferior epigastric artery and vein and if you if you see the little arrow so the second on the right from the anterior aspect that is the inferior epigastric artery and vein and that can be actually quite well seen on mr and so this is a very key landmark that we use and of course you have got the pubic tubercle method sorry this is a ct image you have got the pubic tubercle method which apparently by this turkish paper when it first came out was very exciting that uh, that you know the ephemeral hernia is always behind the x line the x line is a line along the anterior border of the pubic symphysis and the y line is along the two pubic tubercles perpendicular lines and and the distinction between an indirect and direct and the femoral hernia femoral hernia be, being behind the x line it's it's easy here to say this but i'll tell you when it comes to real life it is not so easy and you know people say that why can't you distinguish between a direct sac and indirect sac on imaging and i'll tell you the main problem is that the hernia when it is a mature hernia is big and to identify the neck is often times quite tricky because it is squashing everything down so you know people who say that i've got 100% accuracy in distinction between a direct sac and indirect sac on imaging i disagree because you know in real life that is not possible i know that laparoscopy is a gold standard i know that but to say that categorically on imaging and i would love to hear from aparna and srinivas at the end of this that whether they agree but this is my view that we can go with all of this anteromedial and superior to the pubic tubercle you know posterior lateral and inferior to the pubic tubercle, all of that is great theory but in real life it can be tricky but there are some aids and we can use these aids so for example if you can see the inferior epigastric vessel like this and you can see the hernial sac as pointed by a little arrow arrow head pointing to the inferior epigastric vessels okay this is medial this is a direct sac easy you have this crescent sign called the crescent sign whereby the epigastric vessel is 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 played and you have this crescent sign okay direct sac okay easy sometimes easy because this is clearly lateral okay it is an indirect sac but sometimes it is not so easy you know okay so i, I digress so so the po point i'm trying to make here is that we can give you pointers we can give you suggestions we will probably be accurate in about 90% of the time but we won't be accurate 100% of the time i don't think of course we can improve our sensitivity of a diagnosis of an occult hernia by turning the patient prone you can do that with mr you can do a valsalva both with mr and with ct you can use a dynamic cine image with mr you can use ct fluoroscopy you can ask the patient to a valsalva and do a quick ct scan like in this case and you can demonstrate a potential hernial sac when it is not there in the resting state by doing a strain so i think these things will just highlight ultrasound and ct uh cannot reliably exclude occult groin abnormalities mr is a more definitive radiological examination i cannot see the bottom of my slide but I but i think it says that prone versus supine are equivalent uh mr is supposedly the definitive radiological test some people will say herniography is the definitive test i used to love doing herniography in fact even in india i have done a fair number 
in the uk it is <coughs> fairly common actually to do a herniography but of course it's an invasive test you guys would argue that you know why won't we do a laparoscopy instead of a herniography uh, you know dynamic inguinal ultrasound some people say is very very good i do but not so much i do prefer mr uh, so i'm not i'm not going to talk much about literature uh, so i think bottom line about if you if you combine the literature it is to say that mr is probably the best non invasive gold standard in trying to diagnose a occult hernia and groin pain i think groin pain and groin strain is a composite clinical problem which is much more complex not covered by this talk i think srinivas is a very good person to talk on that and maybe you guys should do a separate session on this because that is not something that should be covered in a session sort of this so i think this is the sort of summary that uh, mr advantages are it is non ionizing it is cross sectional it is multi planar it can be used for dynamic studies you can do a valsalva but it is expensive although in our country nowadays it is no more expensive than ct to be honest with you uh, so i think if you guys agree we can shift to mr to do all of these cases as mr but of course it takes 20 to 25 minutes on the scanner whereas a non contrast ct takes two and a half minutes on the scanner so that is one great advantage of ct so uh, of course imaging for complications i have not covered complications really and i think we will discuss this bit a little bit in the panel about you know seroma and collections but i just wanted to finish my talk about what potentially some i forgot to put one slide actually but i will talk about it so this is a desmoid tumor just copied from the literature i'm sorry this is not my own but you can see the heterogeneous mass occupying much of the right rectus sheath shifting across the midline actually pushing the left rectus down to one side locally invasive as you know this is a desmoid tumor this is heterogeneous and trying to distinguish and this is an abdominal wall endometrioma this is something that i do diagnose because i do a lot of gynecological imaging and you can see the hyper intense focus within the muscle wall and the point that i made about so this is t2 weighted so it is not so bright if i use a t1 fat suppress sequence here then this would have been really really bright now this on the other hand is the advantage of mr so this on ct would appear as an gray mass well defined gray mass so this is a rectus sheath hematoma and can you guys appreciate a very subtle a very subtle fluid fluid level can you appreciate see the hyper bright to the not so bright so this is a oops i lost so this is a rectus sheath hematoma the reason i can confidently say it's a rectus sheath hematoma is the fact that this is bright on t1 blood bright on t1 what is the downside of doing an mr because on ct i would have done an angiogram and i would have imaged the inferior epigastric artery and i would have told you guys whether this is actively bleeding or not if it is actively bleeding then of course we need to go and intervene as i will show you in the next case but or you guys have to go and do something you know but but mr will probably not tell you but this sign of this air fluid sorry fluid fluid level is a sign of a recent hematoma i'm sorry i rushed into this presentation i've got a whole talk on rectus sheath hematoma and there are some lovely imaging caveats on rectus sheath hematoma and to try to characterize the acuteness of the rectus sheath hematoma without a picture if i might just tell you that on ct you will sometimes see a horizontal contrast layer at this junction of the serum and hematocrit and that is a sign of active bleeding and that is a sign of active intervention requirement so so with that i'm going to come to the end of my talk i'm going to finish with a little case and this is a 62 year old male with chronic liver disease under the gastroenterologist for recurrent ascites he gets he gets multiple aspirations he present sorry he gets multiple aspirations for his ascites uh high volume paracentesis so he presents with hypotension so this is not really an abdominal incision most of the time we see this as a complication of a fanon style that is the most common indication to get it so presents with hypotension resuscitated hemoglobin 5.6 shifted from pg hospital in town no recent worsening of liver function tender abdomen just lateral to the midline the ct unfortunately it's a 
I, I can't get hold of the picture uh, at 2015 shows a pseudo aneurysm from the right inferior epigastric artery but it was questionable whether there was a supply from the left or right and this is a point I would try to make in, with the case uh, with a 14 times 8 centimeter hematoma and a 2 centimeter pseudo aneurysm okay so the patient is brought and we, this is something routinely we go and embolize so this is a left angiogram the reason I do a left angiogram is twofold firstly I'm going to access I'm going to access the right inferior epigastric artery from the left side over the bifurcation easier like this and then round the corner the second reason is that watch this okay this is the left injection right and do you see this little blush can you appreciate this blush so this is a blush from the left side okay so this is a very common thing that you have to be aware of that sometimes the inferior epigastric artery because of its cross collaterals even if the parent artery supplying that pseudoaneurysm is from the right side will have a cross supply from the left now as it happens this is not actually directly supplied from the left inferior epigastric artery because once i do the oblique you can actually see the pseudoaneurysm is somewhere here but the artery is so this is just a superimposition this is not really arising from the left inferior epigastric artery but it is an important point that you must do a left injection to make sure that there is no cross supply because then if you close the right inferior epigastric artery the pseudoaneurysm will be continue to be filled from the left so then you will have to embolize the left as well so this is a very common problem so now we go over across the bifurcation like this into the into the epigastric artery and then you you will see a very subtle pseudoaneurysm very subtle in a second hardly seen actually i'll show you in a second so so now we have a selective injection and here is a pseudoaneurysm selective left inferior epigastric there you are and now here is my microcatheter right inside this vessel now because i am so far in super selectively so i have maintained the patency of the native inferior epigastric i'm right inside here into the pseudoaneurysm this is not going to cross fill a and this is not is still going to maintain the inferior epigastric it's always a good idea if you can maintain it and then of course we have put coils so here you are this is the super selective and then we have put some coils and uh, bob's your uncle sorry oops okay that video doesn't play there you are okay so there you are it's been closed right so so in conclusion complex ventral hernias are a complex set of problems in a complex set of patients that need specialized care imaging is critical to predefine the preoperative hernia morphology and identify complications which we are going to hear about today i didn't talk about this today there is increasing role in the ct and mr maybe in offering prognosis predict recurrence and determining which type of surgery and this is better than clinical examination alone there is increasing interface with some specialized dedicated interested radiologists mr does offer non radiating modality of assessment and in certain certain situations and the sorry the the picture that i forgot to put was a few pictures of of actually muscle strains you know when we talk about pain occult hernias sometimes you know rectus obliques muscle strains after lifting a bucket of water the last time i had a patient you would see this stir hyper intensity within the muscle and mr will show you that ct will never show you that so that is one place where mr is very very good so in certain situations mr is an advantage with that i would like to conclude and thank you i have overshot my time i think thank you very much indeed thank you dr shubro that was a very very uh, enlightening presentation especially for all of us who don't know too much about mris and are still learning how to interpret mris so i'd like to uh, put forward certain questions to the esteemed panel um, uh, like dr shubro rightly pointed that MRI is a very good investigation for uh, many years. Um, but maybe if Dr. Srinivas, this I could uh, speak about the role of dynamic ultrasounds in 
uh, inguinal hernias and uh, vis-a-vis, uh, you know, the role of MRI in the inguinal hernias. Good. Uh, that was a great lecture, so I'm, I'm really impressed with, uh, and I, I learned a lot. So, super. That's good. Uh, uh, as uh, Sobhudu has made very, very clear, CT is a gold standard of the hernias, and all the hernias, and especially the inguinal hernia. Uh, he spoke about herniography. Uh, we are, honestly, we don't do herniography in Bombay. I don't know whether anybody else does. So, I have long, long ago, I have done it. I have never done it. The uh, MR certainly shows what all the CT shows, but as he rightly pointed out, it takes much longer time. CT is pretty quick and very, very accurate. So role of MR would be more or less has the same like a CT, but I would any day prefer CT or MR. So I honestly, uh, if you read extensive literature on the hernias, you will not find too much of mention of the MR role in the inguinal hernias as such. Yes, the MR can show the vessels exquisitely and therefore differentiating the direct from indirect, femoral from inguinal becomes a lot easier on MR, especially in the larger hernias where CT, when the vessel gets compressed and as you Subrata made it very clear that it becomes difficult to differentiate from direct to indirect, whether it's really important on imaging to do that or not. When we discuss with our surgical colleague, they say we can make it out, that's not a big issue. And yes, dynamic ultrasound certainly shows the hernia Better, much much better than even the MR. So if there is a there is a role between dynamic ultrasound vis-a-vis -vis MR, I would certainly go for a dynamic ultrasound, which it shows much better. Thank you, Dr. Desai, for your comments. Uh, uh, maybe Dr. Eric Polai could uh, tell us uh, more about the role of MRIs in ventral hernia repairs um, as opposed to CT scans, and if there's any specific role. I think Dr. Shuvro mentioned in his presentation that the quality of the muscle and the thickness of the muscle is something that you can judge better on an MRI. Uh, maybe, uh, Dr. Eric, if you have any comments about that. Put my light back on here. Hey, so, you know, I, first off, uh, man, I love when Dr. Chowdhury gives talks. Like, I learn stuff every single time. I do not know enough about MRI. Um, you know, I, actually, there's a slide in that talk um, where he's describing the the imaging signals, the T1, the T2, and he he put that slide up uh, in our 2008 con 18 conference in India, and I I tried to get a picture of it, and like he changed the slide right as I got the picture, I got the picture this time, and it's perfect. I was sitting here with my camera just below the screen level, so I have that picture now. Um, there is absolutely a role, and some of the things that Dr. Chowdhury pointed out, I think, are important. Number one, the ability to uh, identify mesh. Uh, based off of the difference in MRI characteristics. You know, when mesh is isodense to the stuff that surrounds it on CT imaging, it can be very challenging to find. So if you have a strong need to absolutely find mesh, um, it's certainly helpful. Um, I think that there are additional things that I sometimes wish I had used it for because I've missed something on the CT scan. And I think probably the best example of that is a fluid collection uh, in, the, uh, in the abdominal wall or around the mesh, um, or a small abscess. I, I have, um, uh, in my talk coming up, I'll show you uh, an abscess that was missed on our review of the CT scan because it was small and, and kind of loculated, and it looked like a loop of small bowel on CT scan without contrast. And I think that that would have easily jumped out as um, an abscess uh, with, with an MR, and I think that that would not have been missed. You know, it, it absolutely required us to change our plan in the operating room. And I probably would have thought differently about the patient if I had known it was there ahead of time. So there are, there are definitely some areas where those, um, where those uh, MR images, you know, can have an advantage. It's a little challenging, though. Um, there are probably more, right? There are probably more areas. I, I think because we don't use it as the gold standard, and we're so used to kind of living in a world of CT scan and kind of working with the imaging that we have and making our plans based off of it, that, you know, it's, it's the Luddite view of the world that you can train anybody to do anything if you give them, you know, enough time. And so we as hernia surgeons are so used to looking at CT scans, we find workarounds. I'll bet you if we were better at MR and better look at looking at it ourselves, we would order more and probably find new and different ways uh, to have advantages. Thanks, Eric. That was very enlightening. Um, 
maybe uh, again when we come back to the presentation that Dr. Shubhra made, he spoke about using the pubic tubercle as a landmark uh, to identify the type of hernia, whether it's direct, indirect, or femoral. Um, uh, so uh, maybe Aparna, you could shed more light on that. And do you ever think that um, imaging as a modality would ever become a gold standard for diagnosing the type of hernia? Or would it always remain laparoscopy? Um, I think Dr. Chaudhary's presentation was extremely informative. And like he rightly said, for moderate size hernias, yes, you can identify the neck using these uh, anatomical landmarks. But when there are large hernias, because all the vessels are splayed, then it becomes difficult. So I don't think it can replace laparoscopy, especially when the hernias are large and your anatomy is distorted. But when the size is moderate, I think, yes, we can definitely tell. Right. Thanks, Aparna. That's uh, succinctly explained. Um, Dr. Ramanna, if you have any other comments to add to Dr. Shubro's presentation. Um, I think the most important uh, issue which Shubro, uh, for obvious reasons, failed to uh, explain is our illiteracy. Surgeons are MR illiterate. Over the years, we have managed to learn to read CTs to a fairly acceptable levels, but we are still largely MR illiterate. We need to learn that much, much better. It's not the radiologist's fault, it's ours. Thank you, Dr. Ramanna. Uh, Charlotte, uh, would you like to add anything to Dr. Shubro's presentation? Um, it was excellent. I will completely agree. You know, we are so used to using CT scans and understanding them and reading them that it's, you know, something that we order as a gold standard. But I think especially in um, some of the chronic groin pain situations and um, when approaching inguinal hernias, I think like, after listening to the lecture, I think it's definitely superior. And although I have been trained with dynamic ultrasound, that is, you know, very user dependent. Um, and uh, also like the technologist is, you know, you're kind of relying on them. Um, and sometimes this can be hard when you're doing ultrasound. So, you know, really utilizing MRI as uh, an alternative, um, if you don't have that available to you, can really help delineate some of the musculoskeletal things instead of just looking at hernias, which is great. And sometimes you pick up these very small hernias on an ultrasound and you don't really know if that's actually causing the symptoms. And so having them in a larger context, kind of being able to really evaluate the uh, pelvic structures with MRI is very useful. And the other, other indication that I would think about is age. If, if, if you've got a young patient, then it is much better to use MRI if you're not using ultrasound, MR, simply because of the radiation. Because, you know, uh, it, it is better to withhold rad radiation with MR. Unfortunately, Dr. Shuvro, I can't remember even one dynamic ultrasound which has actually given me a diagnosis of an inguinal hernia. Maybe it's a uh, poor radiologist, maybe it's a difficult technique, I don't know. But it's just very difficult. No, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think, to be honest with you, I think SBD, you heard Srinivas talk about it. The, the, the concept of, uh, the main advantage of dynamic ultrasound is the fact that it, it, you are getting a valsalva. You're actually seeing something coming and going. But to be honest with you, you need to be so certain about your anatomical landmarks, below which you consider that this is a hernia as opposed to the normal bulge because you know if you ask somebody to cough and put a, put an ultrasound probe in the groin I, I you know one other day we will have to talk about groin as a separate issue because i think uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg the inguinal hernias is only a small fraction of groin problem so i think maybe we'll talk about it another day but generally speaking you have to have a radiologist who understands you know understands the femoral uh, sorry the inguinal canal anatomy and how does it translate to an ultrasound very, very well. So it is a user dependent. The advantage of CT and MR is they're cross-sectional, right? So you can draw lines and you can, and because you can also do Valsalva, maybe you cannot stand the patient up. That's a great advantage of ultrasound because you can stand the patient up with ultrasound, which you can't with CT and MR. But because you can do Valsalva, you can do prone, etc. So there are 
as Aparna said, I think to be honest with you, this is, you know, people who say that these imaging modalities are 100% accurate are, I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm not that good. Uh, well, can I just pitch in? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sure. What you said, Doc, is very right because the, the ultrasound is very operative dependent. And therefore, you need a great amount of expertise and and interest of the ultrasonologist in doing a particular work. Our ultrasonologists are really good because I'm telling, telling from our hospital uh, experience, they're pretty good. And they seem to diagnose many times. So in, in case I have an issue, probably I might consider their opinion. I'm, I don't do the ultrasound, I'm more of a CTMR guy and I firmly believe in CTMR. But yes, I have seen that being done and absolutely, being diagnosed. Absolutely. Yeah, being diagnosed. And, and the standing, important standing. thing about C CTMR is, is a the reproducible images. While ultrasound is so operator determined, they are, they, they are, those are not the reproducible images. And therefore, the suspicion, the area, the inclarity, those things do come up if there is no good understanding and uh, talk between the referring surgeon and the ultrasonologist. And if the ultrasonologist doesn't have the interest in doing that particular spe speciality, that's an important issue. Right. Uh, I think Dr. Jignesh Gandhi has a very pertinent uh question or rather comment uh, in the chat. Um, his question is, do we conclude that a CT is better for pre-op imaging and an MRI better for post-op imaging as you know, an MRI can pick up complications better? Whom are you addressing? Uh, so uh, Dr. Srinivas, if you can take that question. Yes, th then I'll congratulate Subrato that he has induced somebody to ask this question. Subrato, fantastic job, I should say. Because honestly, the answer is CT suffices for everything, to be honest, especially when it comes to the hernia, whether it's a complex ventral hernias or any other hernias. CT is the gold standard. MR, sure, and I'm an MR guy, so I would love this question and I'll say yes, but not necessarily. You, can, uh, uh, it, you can't generalize the statement that you could you keep the CT, uh, MR for the post-operative and CT for the pre-operative. CT will give you all, all the diagnosis of the post-operative complications also. Sure, MR, because of its high tissue characterization, ability to show the muscles separately, and that is shown very nicely because the fat between the muscles, and therefore you can make out if there is some segmentation, separation, surgeries, complement surgeries have been done and all that better, yes. But I don't think there is a great, if somebody who is very good in CT, he can almost diagnose everything on CT. I, on the I, would, I would just add to what Srinivas said very briefly, I would quickly refer to Ram, who's my hernia surgeon, ask him what mesh it is. And if the, suppose it's a mesh and it's a mesh complication that we're trying to assess, then I would look up my chart as to what is the likelihood of that mesh being visible on CT versus MR. I would use that as a judgment to choose. Uh, uh, and of course, with the small advantages of diagnosing a hematoma over a fluid collection more categorically with MR. So there is some sense in what uh, the, you know, <laughs> what, what uh, Jignesh has asked. There is some sense in that, but equally CT is so much easier quickly inside the gantry and out in a patient who's got complication. You don't want a 20 minute examination. You right. want a two minute examination. So, you know, you can like everything in life. It is always gray and you can argue both ways. <laughs> Um, Harsh, let's have uh, Eric uh, start his talk because it's going to take a while. Yeah, All right. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Shubro. That was a great presentation. And I think we'll leave you to go and perform that Doppler for the post transplantation. No, no, I'll listen to Eric, Eric's talk. I cannot not listen to Eric's talk. Great. Okay. Uh, I can see Eric is excited about that. All right. Over uh, to you, Ian. Uh, superb, guys. So our next speaker for the evening or morning, depending on where you are, is uh, Dr. Eric Pollack. Uh, Eric is a professor of surgery at Penn State uh, Hershey Medical Center. He's also the director of endoscopic surgery. So he has this amazing combination of doing a surgical endoscopist plus doing complex AWR. Uh, but his superpower is clearly like X-ray vision. Eric has CT vision. And uh, honestly, over the past few years, a bunch of us have learned a lot about uh, CTs in uh, abdominal wall imaging from him. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this uh, lecture. All right, well, um, uh, thanks, Ahan, those really kind words. And uh, as I said earlier, 
Um, I, Dr. Chaudhary, I, I just, I love, I love watching you talk. I, I you know, the other thing that I'm, I'm going to, this is going to happen again. You know, that last lecture we did together, we didn't really plan anything. No, we didn't. Worked out really well because of coming at things from different perspectives. Yes, and indeed. I think that this is going to potentially be uh, very similar. Um, let me do my screen share here. Can you guys see my slides? Yep. Yep. Okay. And let me just put up my screen here. Okay. Um, so uh, as uh, Aham said, I, um, uh, you know, I am a, I'm a surgeon and we're going to talk about this stuff from a surgical perspective. I don't know how many surgeons versus radiologists we have on the call. Um, I'm definitely a surgeon, although um, if Dr. Chaudhary would like to get me honorary appointment as a radiologist, that's like my next, that's the next feather in my cap that I'm looking for. I want like joint appointment as a radiologist somewhere. Um, I have some disclosures which are really, well, have not anything to do with the talk um, today. So I put this slide up whenever I talk about um, radiology. I had the pleasure of visiting my friend Philip Moissens in Belgium, and beforehand we went to uh, Amsterdam and we spent some time kicking around museums. And um, we, we got to see this really cool exhibit on, on Rembrandt sketches. And you look at this amazing Rembrandt sketch and you, you, know, you see all the detail. But the trick to this picture is that the name of the picture is actually called the Baby Walker. And the important part of the picture is not the stuff that's easily seen in the foreground. It's the stuff that is extremely subtle in the background. And Rembrandt actually painted this as a reminder to pupils that you can master your craft and the subtleties of your craft come through constant practice. And, and radiology and the ability to view CT scans and MRIs in black and white is really this exact same thing. You need to do this regularly. Um, as Romana said, you know, in particular for MRIs, we just, we just don't do it enough and that's why we're bad at it. There's no reason that we as surgeons can't look at films and begin to understand the principles that Dr. Chaudhary was uh, talking about. So for this talk, what I'm gonna do is kind of highlight the routine use of CT scans for the imaging of hernia patients. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, the information that you can gather from these films that will obviously inform the hernia repair. And then I'm gonna spend maybe the second half of the talk just kind of going through some films of some patients so that you guys can see a little bit of the practicalities about how I do it. I think because we use MRI so, uh, so, so rarely, or we look at these so rarely as surgeons, I think Dr. Chowdhury's points about understanding how the sequences work, that basic information is probably much more important in his talk. I think because we as surgeons use CT scans a lot more often and we look at them, I'm gonna spend less time talking about kind of how the images are acquired and what you should be looking for. I'm gonna assume that we have a, a background kind of shared knowledge in that. And I'm gonna to try to put um, the, the knowledge base into practice and talk about some of the principles that we'll show you. So I use imaging very commonly for preoperative planning. Um, somebody asked in the comment section there, you know, what's better for preoperative stuff and postoperative stuff. I heavily rely on CT scans for preoperative planning. I absolutely use these for intraoperative assistance. And if you've ever spent some time in the OR with me, you know that at various times during the case, when I come to an area of difficult dissection or an area where I think I've got some freedom and I can be a little more aggressive, I usually pause we just look at the scan for a minute and say, yeah, you know, the left upper quadrant on this person, it's all just a mental fat up there. Just get up there, sweep, sweep, sweep. There's no bowel nearby, you know, you're good to go. Um, Post-operative complications, as was talked about, you know, there are some advantages to CT versus MRI. Uh, I actually just, while the Dr. Chaudhary was talking, I actually ripped uh, one additional video and added it to the talk to be based off of a point that he made. So we'll show some complications. CTs are very nice for follow-up uh, of the long-term recurrence rates and long-term complication rates of patients. You know, in an era in which we do a lot of retromuscular operations, uh, palpating problems, including posterior sheath defects, retromuscular seromas, and hematomas is not always possible at the bedside. And so CT imaging can obviously help you find uh, a lot of these things, including long-term complications. Um, CT scans, again, being the most useful overall. Uh, I think the biggest issue that we have with CT imaging is that th acquiring these things is very standard. It is not user dependent, uh, but interpreting the images and the reporting of these images are not standardized. What Dr. Chaudhry talked about was having a discussion with the surgeon, right? 
he and Ramana have a very good relationship where if there's any question, he's just going to call and ask, where's the mesh? What mesh? What did you use? And that informs his report. And that interaction does not happen uh, at many places, even at my own institution. I don't get called very often by the radiologist to ask questions about the repair that we did. Um, and, and I think that what that means is that Ramana is probably getting you know, better reports as a consequence of that informed uh, and shared decision making about what's on the films. We know that there is a 70% discordance rate between the initial review of films, especially hernia films, by radiologists and by surgeons. If you're looking at things that are missed, ventral hernias are the second most commonly missed structure um, uh, on, on studies. Um, they're commonly inaccurately reported as well in terms of the number of hernias, the size of the hernias, um, you know, missed information like is this a direct or an indirect inguinal? Again, some of the topics that we hit upon earlier. And we know as hernia surgeons, that this is an everyday occurrence. So this is uh, from the International Hernia Collaboration. Uh, you know, this, this image was posted and it says that the clinical impression uh, by radiology was interpreted on this film as bilateral rectus diastasis with herniation of fat only. You know, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think anybody uh, who does hernia surgery can look at this and say, yeah, I mean, these are rectus muscles and there's no way that this is a diastasis. This is, this is a hernia. And even if you thought that, I mean, there's bowel underneath this. And so saying that there's herniation of fat only is, you know, is not accurate. And, you know, these are the comments, need new radiologists. I mean, that, that's a bit of an inflammatory comment. Um, I think the second comment here that says, you know, you got to read the re and review the reports. And the radiologists may not have an understanding of how the terms affect what we do as surgeons. And you have to call and sort of teach them. And, and I, I think that this is probably the better comment, right? The radiologists are, are not intending to misinterpret these films. They are also looking at things that are potentially more important, right? Is there a liver tumor or a liver mass? Is there a bowel obstruction? The interpretation of the abdominal wall imaging is not a standardized part of the reporting. And again, calling up, talking, going down to the radiology department, looking at images together informs their reads. And so whenever I have a discrepancy in terms of the read that I have with a radiologist, especially if it impacts what I'm going to offer the patient, if I need to review the films and ask them to amend the report, you know, I'm happy to do that. And um, yeah, I think the biggest example that I can give you of, of how this has changed, you know, their practice and, and mine is for retromuscular peristomal hernia repairs, where we are intentionally positioning bowel between the layers of the abdominal wall you know, that looks radiographically like an intraparietal hernia because on some level it is. I mean, we are intentionally trapping bowel between muscle and mesh. And so the early um, reads on my retromuscular, uh, you know, sort of poli peristomal hernia repair patients were commonly read as, you know, bowel trapped between the layers of the abdominal wall. And so over the course of time, having done a lot of these here, having reviewed those reports with the radiologists, now they will call me and ask, hey, is this this type of operation? Because if it is, if we know that, we know what the report should say. And so they've kind of changed their reporting as a consequence of that. Um, when I am looking at a patient preoperatively, there are obviously some things that come into play that influence how I'm gonna think about their report, I'm sorry, think about their operation. That includes the, the physical examination, you know, I, um, unlike Dr. Chaudhry, you know, I, I have the advantage of potentially laying hands on the patient to feel, and then I can kind of put that physical exam together with the abdominal imaging studies. And then I also have the advantage of having the old operative notes, um, you know, in my, so even if I don't have the, the surgeon on the horn, I have the film, I have the report to kind of understand like what were they intending to do with this operation. And I think that, that the fact that I have two things that are my radiologists don't is part of the reason why I can look at these films with a, a slightly you know, jaundiced eye. And you know, I have extra information that's been hidden from them. And so if, if people are working with a lack of information, the report is going to be influenced by that. So when I look at the old op notes, obviously I'm trying to understand what operation was being described. Op notes for hernia surgery um, are terrible. I think we can all agree to that. They commonly don't include what mesh was used um, or how big it was or things like that. 
you know, I don't know what a left paramedian juxta umbilical ventral abdominal hernia incisional is. That's a lot of words to explain an M3 incisional hernia. Um, and so even with the report, you may be a little bit handicapped. Understanding if mesh was used, where it was placed, and what kind of mesh is there is also helpful because as Dr. Chaudhry said, you know, if you know what mesh is there, you have the ability to think about what imaging modality might be best to identify where this mesh is physically located. Uh, knowing what anatomic planes have been violated in terms of whether components were intended to be separated is helpful because you can then look for evidence of that on your imaging study and, and find out does what they described or what they intended to do in terms of a component separation match what's on the scan. I also look uh, uh, you know, to determine how hard was the adhesiolysis of that imaging study because then I can try and figure out, like, should I be doing this open or minimally invasive? Uh, you know, what, what is the better option here? You know, why physical examination uh, or CT versus physical examination? I think that imaging should really augment. It, it ultimately cannot replace your physical examination. But physical examination alone misses a good percent of, of hernias. These are small hernias, subclinical hernias. You know, some patients, it's challenging because of their obesity or the presence of an ostomy to determine the size of the defect. So even though you know, yeah, this person clearly has a hernia, you can't physically examine them and figure out how big it is um, and where the uh, defect edges are. There are clearly things that you will see on imaging that you are not going to detect on CT scan and vice versa. And again, this is where as the surgeon with the patient physically in front of me in clinic, I do have a little bit of an advantage. Here's an example of that. Um, this is a patient who presented to my clinic with a CT scan report of diastasis. Uh, he was referred to me by um, a rehab center that he was in. This guy actually, this guy actually had a spinal cord injury. He had some sort of a fall, and was like, uh, he had a spinal cord, um, a temporary spinal cord injury, and was paralyzed from like the shoulders down. So he came to me like on a big gurney, and it was kind of fun to watch because as we were getting him ready for surgery he kept getting better, better, better. And actually on the day of surgery, he kind of walked into clinic, whereas the first time he couldn't even walk. So uh, it was kind of cool to watch that. But you know, this, guy's, this guy's imaging shows, let me move my mouse here so you can see it. You know, Here's a rectus, uh, here's a bridge, uh, and here's, here's a rectus here. And if you, if you look at this, you say, yeah, you know, this looks like a diastasis, but there's a few things about this if you have the op note. Number one, he has mesh. And once you know that, you can kind of pick up that this is probably the medial, um, I'm sorry, the lateral edge of some mesh that was bridged here. And number two, you know, there's, there's clearly some inflammatory thing going on here that is different than the contralateral side. And so, you know, what we're actually seeing here is this area correlates with um, uh, this area of infection right here. And if we zoom in on that and take a look with our eyes, um, this is obviously an area of infection and lower down there's obviously some permanent synthetic mesh eroding through the abdominal wall. This patient was an active smoker uh, and he also has MRSA. And so obviously that informs you know, the operation we're gonna offer this patient. Um, other things I look for on the CT scan is obviously how big is the defect. Um, you know, we wanna figure out uh, how wide the rectus muscles are in an era, again, of retromuscular operations being the king. You know, we're trying to figure out what components, if any, am I going to separate? Is this a preperitoneal operation? Uh, is it retrorectus alone? Or am I going to have to separate additional components? Understanding where the defects are located, like this subxiphoid defect, obviously defects that abut bony landmarks require additional understanding of how to cross behind or above those landmarks to afford a repair. Um, are all the defects being accounted for? You know, this person obviously has a midline defect which is not that big. And if that was the only defect, a retro, retro rectus repair would be ideal. But this person has an old ostomy site defect here. That ostomy site defect, you know, obviously is uh, beginning to encroach upon the linea semilunaris. And so if you're just planning a retro rectus operation on this person, I gotta be honest with you, you're not gonna have a lot of overlap here. And so you might change your plan and think about maybe a preperitoneal, maybe a unilateral tar, maybe an onlay repair that can easily go past the semilunar line if you don't do retromuscular hernia operations. 
Um, we can think about the Carbonell ratio. You know, this has not made it into print yet, but this is obviously a concept that uh, Al Alfie Carbonell and his group from Greenville, um, uh, uh, South Carolina, kind of talked about, which is that if the if the defect size is twice the size of the ret the retrorectal space, you're probably going to need something beyond a retrorectus release to do the repair. And in you know, in most in my practice, that would be a tar. But you're going to need something else, and so um, you know he's got data to back this concept up. And again, you know this this probably matches if you weren't aware of this ratio, probably matches what your practice is now. I think getting the ability to look at a scan and say this person needs something beyond a retrorectus repair most likely will not only help you have a discussion with the patient about how big the operation is going to be. But for me, it also helps me plan my operative time, right? This is not just retrorectus, almost certainly gonna be a TAR. I'm gonna plan this for four hours instead of three hours, right? Um, are all the defects being accounted for? You know, this patient came to me with a CT scan that said low midline hernia, which is true. Here are ret rectus muscles here. This is a patient who had a fan and steel incision. And so what we're seeing is actually content coming through uh, in between the rectus muscles, we've got bowel content herniating through. This is actually kind of cool because of the way fan and steel incisions happen. You can actually see the external oblique here being lifted up off of the rectus. And so the actual fascial gap is from here to here. The defect in the rectus muscles is from here to here. So you've got some separation of components as a result of the type of incision. But there is this bulge on the side, which is not in the report. And, you know, on this particular particular cut, it's not super obvious, but if you go one cut above, this becomes much more obvious that there is a partial thickness defect of the abdominal wall here with intact external oblique being stretched and internal oblique and transversus being disrupted. And this is the lateral extent of a fan and steel incision that went just a little too far lateral and only the external oblique was closed. And so if you only fix that low midline defect, this patient is absolutely going to come back to you not too long later and say, hey, um, speaking of hernias, what about this bulge on the side? You know, can we fix this now? And so obviously knowing that these are there allows you to repair them all at once. How about denervation injuries? This is a patient who has had a unilateral operation. We can see an intact, pretty healthy looking right side rectus abdominis. We can see a linea alba that has a little bit of diastasis here. Um, this person does have a hernia lower down, but the reason I, I chose this cut is you can see that this rectus is actually quite denervated here as a result of his previous surgeries. And so this person is somebody you've got to counsel that even though we fix your hernia, as this denervation continues to progress, this guy may have some bulging and weakness. And I just want them to be aware of that up front. This is also a person I might consider changing my mesh choice to a heavyweight mesh uh, because of the need to support an abdominal wall, which is not going to have good muscle tone at the end of the day. This patient is almost completely denervated. This guy came to me with a peristomal hernia, which he, which he does have. Um, you can see the, the defect here in the left-sided rectus abdominis, but you'll notice that he is almost devoid of muscle, okay? He's got a psoas muscle, he's got an iliacus here, but like almost everything else is missing. I mean, this guy's, this guy's got um, no gluteus, he's got no lateral muscles, he's got no rectus. And when I talk with this guy, He's had this progressive weakness that's been ongoing for years over the course of time, and he had really just never complained about it. And I sent him to neurology, and they, they actually diagnosed him um, with a progressive uh, neuropathy. And, you know, ultimately, this guy was so debilitated, um, he, he actually progressed to the point where he was unable to walk. Uh, we never actually repaired his peristomal hernia because it's not bothersome. He, he doesn't wear a bag. He doesn't do all that much. And so, um, again, understanding the imaging allowed us to not only make a diagnosis, but really radically change the plan for, for repair in this guy. Um, let's shift and talk a little bit about mesh. You know, we want to figure out where mesh is located. And so having the report is helpful. And obviously, understanding mesh characteristics allows you to pick out that this, this thing here is mesh. You know, in some cases, understanding what the mesh looks like uh, influences the repair. This patient has bowel. Actually, um, on both sides of the mesh, there's actually some bowel here and there's some bowel here. And I saw this and I thought, you know, that doesn't look quite right. 
And my concern was if I've got a bowel, if I've got a coated mesh placed laparoscopically, which is what this was, and I've got bowel on both sides of the mesh, some of that might be trapped and adherence to the mesh. You know, and sure enough, when we get in, we've got bowel on the coated side of the mesh, no big deal, but you've got bowel coming up stuck to the uh, uncoated side of the mesh as well. And obviously dense adhesiolysis, probably not things that I'm gonna do in a minimally invasive fashion. I'm just not that good. Uh, and so obviously when you take this mesh out, you know, this, this image of the mesh correlates pretty nicely with the radiographic appearance on the CT scan. And so, you know, you, you get a sense of how accurate the imaging can be. Let's talk a little bit about identifying mesh on imaging. Um, on CT scan, the ability to find mesh really depends heavily on what surrounds the mesh and what density of mesh we're talking about. And so those two factors uh, weigh heavily in your ability to find the mesh on the CT scan. I will tell you that regardless of the mesh density, if there is fat on either side of the mesh, um, especially if it's on both sides of the mesh, it's going to be much easier to find. Um, as Dr. Chaudhry nicely pointed out, um, looking for those, you know, those non-anatomic folds and wrinkles and rolls in the mesh is probably the easiest thing to start looking for and if there is radiopaque mesh fixation, that is extremely helpful as well to show you, you know, the intended mesh boundaries. Again, as the surgeon with access to the old op notes, especially if it's not your patient, read those notes um, to help you find out. A different version of the, um, of the imaging uh, slide that Dr. Chaudhry uh, put up, this one focused mostly on CT scan. Again, if you just go from the top to the bottom, from clearly visible to poorly visible, um, you basically the biggest differences are the the mesh density as we move from top of this slide to the bottom of the slide. You know this is a modified version of a slide that uh, Carl LeBlanc initially published in a paper about identifying mesh on CT scans. His bottom slide said invisible, and um, I, I don't think that that is true. Uh, these can be hard to identify, but once you understand the secondary characteristics you're looking for inflammation around the mesh, folds and wrinkles in the mesh, um, areas where there's fat around the mesh, they are poorly visible, but not invisible. You can, you can begin to understand where they are. Even if you're not seeing the mesh, you are seeing the mesh location and understanding what's going on at that location. So let's look at some mesh on, in, on a CT imaging. Um, all right, so this is a patient who uh, has a piece of uh, intraperitoneally placed mesh from a laparoscopic repair. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in the operative note, this was an IPOM, but not an IPOM plus. And so the fat was left against the abdominal wall. So the falciform ligament was not taken down. And so we can see this mesh because there is fat behind the rectus above the mesh. And there is omental fat between the liver uh, and the mesh itself. And so here we see the mesh but we can also identify this mesh based off of the non-anatomic folds and wrinkles, okay? I have lots of wrinkles, I'm getting older. None of my wrinkles are in my peritoneum. Um, this is not what the peritoneum should look like, so clearly visible. Here's a patient who has a piece of mesh placed uh, for an incisional hernia uh, in the left rectus abdominis muscle. And again, things that I'm noticing here, number one, there is some preperitoneal fat and some abdominal fat, and so the mesh is visible you see this sawtooth wave pattern of mesh contracture. And again, as, as we start to think about looking for additional findings, look at the left rectus and the right rectus and compare them and realize that there, as a consequence of the previous surgery, there is some amount of denervation here of this left rectus muscle and some fatty replacement of the muscle, which make the mesh even visible in areas where there should be a sort of normal, normal muscle bulk. Uh, this is a patient who has a piece of EPTFE uh, that was placed in the abdominal wall in an IPOM repair. Uh, we can see the mesh because EPTFE, this is thin EPTFE, but it's, it's always visible on CT imaging as this very nice white uh, line. We can see the uh, radiopaque mesh fixation. This is spiral tack fixation, and we can even see the recurrent hernia. Um, we can also begin, though, to speculate a little bit about the, the reason that this patient got a recurrence. If I asked everybody to tell me why this patient recurred, you would all look at this and say, because there's a lot of mesh behind the right rectus muscle, and less than 50% of the mesh covering the midline 
and no mesh coverage of the left side of the abdominal wall. So this was mesh that may have been either undersized or more likely placed off center. And if I ask you what side of the patient the surgeon was standing on when they started tacking this mesh in place, I think you would all say, gosh, I'll bet you they were standing on the left-hand side and did all the work from the left and uh, they short sheeted themselves on the center coverage. And the answer is, yeah, that's true. All this patient's lap ports are on the left. There are no right-sided ports. And that's why this, uh, that's why this occurred. Here is an onlay piece of heavyweight polypropylene mesh. This mesh is visible because the onlay did not, uh, the, the flap that was created left a little bit of fat on the abdominal wall. So they didn't really skeletonize all the way down to the external oblique fascia. Second reason it's visible is that we've got skin staples used to secure the mesh to the abdominal wall as is sometimes done with onlay. And so we can see the lateral edges marked by radio opaque boundaries. And we can also see the mesh covering um, uh, the abdominal wall. There's fat on both sides of it. No recurrent hernia here. So just a nice intact onlay repair. Here is a patient who had a uh, inguinal hernia done. Uh, the mesh is visible as this non-anatomic fold and wrinkle. There is a little bit of taco shelling of the mesh. Um, this patient came to me actually with chronic groin pain. And we can see protax in an area where we would not expect to see tax in a standard laparoscopic uh, uh, inguinal repair. Um, this operative note actually specifically says that they put tax in the triangle of pain. It says it in the report that we safely put tax in the triangle of pain with any complications. And so it's not surprising that this patient has pain. It's in the report. There's tax in the wrong spot. And you can see some problems related to that as well. So, you know, a review of the imaging and a re review of the report tells you what's going on with this patient. This is a patient who has a um, intact uh, a TAPP repair with heavyweight mesh. I can tell you a couple things about this repair. Number one, this was a TAPP and not a TEP. You know, a lot of TEPs happen in the pretransversalis plane, and the mesh winds up directly against the muscle and makes it very hard to see. This patient had a heavyweight piece of polypropylene. And again, you can sort of look at the thickness of this mesh and get a sense that it's maybe a little bit thicker than um, a lighter weight polypropylene. But there is some preperitoneal fat here between the rectus muscle and the mesh. And in a, in a sort of well done TAPP repair where you really do stay preperitoneal the entire time, all that preperitoneal fat should stay up against the abdominal wall and up against the epigastric vessels. And so you get a fat plane here that makes it visible. You're seeing intra-abdominal fat here, which you're not seeing, obviously. The peritoneum and the muscle, or and the mesh itself, there's no distinguishing those two things, okay? They, they look the same. I can see two pieces of, uh, two radiopaque mesh fixation here in a normal location. And I say normal because we can see the anterior superior iliac spine coming up, and these pieces, these fixation are above the iliopubic tract, and so I know that this person put the tax in the right spot. I can also tell you this is a TAPP repair because if I slide up just a few more cuts, I can actually see the fixation that was used to close the flap, all right? So I don't need the operative note to know that this person um, who did this repair knows what they're doing, did a, a, a pretty good operation, and this person has no complications. This person was being seen for, you know, for other reasons. Um, just happened to be a nice view of that repair. Here is some retromuscular mesh in a patient who had a, a well done retro rectus repair with heavyweight mesh. The mesh was then cut through during a second open operation, and so we have a, a midline recurrence. Again, you know, if I told you that there was mesh here, you would look at this area and say, gosh, you know, it's a little challenging to see. But as I think about it, the retromuscular space here does look a little bit thick. And what are these? Well, these are actually clips that were used to secure uh, and manage some bleeding in the retromuscular space. So this surgeon chose to clip a lot of retromuscular vessels as opposed to just, um, you know, just using cautery or ties. And so we begin to get a sense of here's mesh here, here's break in the mesh, and here's mesh on this side. So you begin to see it. Um, here's some mesh that just, I mean, it's just poorly placed laparoscopic mesh, probably undersized for the defect. There's fat on the wrong side of the mesh that probably was not taken down uh, correctly. 
Um, here's a report. Um, this is one of my patients, and this report said um, no evidence of recurrent hernia uh, diastasis of the midline. All right. Um, again, this is a great example uh, of those non-anatomic folds and wrinkles that you can begin to see when you start to look for where mesh is located. And I'll tell you that this is uh, this is a piece of um, 4-hydroxybutyrate. This is Phasix ST mesh that I put in as a planned bridged repair. So it just it just spans the gap from rectus to rectus muscle. This was not intended to be a definitive operation. This person had other stuff going on at the time. Over the course of time, what you're seeing is some mesh contracture. You're seeing some folds and some wrinkles. And so this looks like a diastasis because there's not a hernia. But um, you and I know that you know the, the, the diastatic fascia does not wrinkle like this. And so this is, this is, fat, this is mesh. Now, um, here is some retromuscular mesh. And these are, um, these are some of my TAR patients and retrorectus patients. And I put these here because these are areas where it becomes very, very challenging to find uh, the mesh. So this is a retrorectus repair. Um, you really can't see the mesh, uh, specifically because this is a lighter weight polypropylene mesh. It's isodense to the muscle. But you can see the consequences of the repair insofar as there is really one rectus muscle here, right? The right and left rectus muscles are one motor unit. And for most retrorectus repairs, when you achieve you know, complete medialization of the rectus muscles, this is what they look like. You lose a linea alba and you basically just gain one big muscle motor unit in the midline, okay? This is a patient who's had a tar and ultimately it's the exact same thing. There is a piece of mesh that I know spans from side to side all the way across. Um, it's lighter weight polypropylene. And so these are patients in whom that mesh is poorly visualized. But again, if you look in the midline, there's just one big kind of rectus complex here. And so I know that something has happened here um, in the midline. Now, several years ago, I switched um, from using a lot of transfascial suture fixation to essentially using a fibrin sealant fixation. And you know the, the results of that have been, uh, I think, less pain post-op as evidenced by less narcotic use. Um, no difference in our recurrence rate but I can now look at these scans and I can sort of tell you whether I glued patients or whether I put that mesh in really tight. And I'm gonna show you here the subtlety. Uh, the mesh is visualized because there is some preperitoneal fat here around the epigastric vessels. So this is the edge of the mesh. But as we get closer to the midline, you again see this little bit of a sawtooth wave pattern in the retromuscular space, okay? And these very subtle sawtooth waves are the result of mesh contracture, or maybe just mesh being a bit wrinkled because it was not placed with, with suture fixation to pull it taut and keep it there while the mesh was granulating in place. And so I can now look at these and say, you know, I can gauge suture fixation versus non-suture fixation as well. Uh, different patient, a little bit of a higher cut up above. Again, there's just this kind of wrinkled, wrinkled view of the posterior rectus uh, sheet. You know, this, this used to make me want to vomit uh, in terms of I always wanted the mesh to be super duper flat, but you know what? There's no, there's no consequences to this. They don't develop recurrences. And so um, uh, I, I'm okay with the fact that radiographically, it's not quite as you know, perfect as it used to be. Um, I'll conclude the section here on mesh by saying that there are mesh manufacturers. Uh, I don't have access to these in the US. I don't know if you guys have these in India, but meshes that have you know, um, metal, uh, or titanium woven into them to make them visualized or visible on imaging studies. Here's an MR of uh, some of these visual, you know, these meshes that are visual meant to be visualized. Obviously, the MR image and this and the you know, the photo image here correlate very nicely. These are very useful to determine not only where mesh is located, but to gauge you know mesh contracture and things like that over the course of time. I mentioned this earlier when somebody asked, like you know, would I prefer an MRI or when are the times to get an MRI pre-op? This is that patient where you know sometimes things get missed. Uh, the arrow here is pointing out what is an abdominal wall fluid collection, which I basically just I plowed right past this. Okay, it looks like a loop of bowel. It's easily missed as a loop of bowel. This is a non-contrast CT image. This patient has no concerns for an infection, and I did uh, a robotic transversus abdominis release on this patient. I did the tar on both sides. Uh, I reconstructed the floor. 
I was uh, busy closing the uh, uh, the uh, the ceiling and, and closing the anterior fascia. And for the life of me, at the bottom edge of this, I could not make the sutures rotate through the abdominal wall. The needle just kept rotating out. And I said, like, I don't know what's going on here. Something is obviously wrong. I'm not happy with the fascial closure, so I'm I'm going to open and complete this as a hybrid repair. And when I opened, this is what I found. Uh, this orphaned piece of probably some biologic mesh, which I, I don't remember if I knew that that was there, but you can obviously see the, uh, the polyester uh, braided suture here with a big abscess around it, and this is uh, MRSA. And so, you know, we, we were kind of already committed to the tar at that point. Um, you know, we took, I mean, I opened this on the back table, so we didn't spill a lot of this on the field. Um, and so we, we completed the operation as planned after a heavy abdominal wall debridement as well. Um, some final questions you can ask on the imaging study, you know, if there's a history of obstruction, um, I wanna know if the hernia is the reason for the obstruction or if it's interloop adhesions or something else. Again, if I'm gonna do a minimally invasive operation and not deal with anything except adhesions to the abdominal wall and within the hernia, I don't wanna leave folks with the risk or, or you know, leave them with a the bowel obstruction at the end of the day. And again, this is very challenging, but I think if you are looking at it uh, um, with, with that in mind, you can find it. Um, this patient has a history of a radical cystectomy for a bladder cancer. And obviously we know that the uh, urologists strip all of the posterior elements of the abdominal wall, generally from the umbilicus down to take any uh, uracal remnants with them. And as a consequence of that, there's exposed muscle. And when muscle is exposed, bowel gets stuck to it. I think anybody can look at this loop here and say, there is a loss of the normal anatomic fat planes between the rectus here and this loop of bowel. And knowing that this person had a cystectomy, I, I can assure you this is gonna be very densely stuck. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't do this minimally invasively, but I am telling you that if you're gonna, you gotta be prepared for that to be an area where you're gonna spend a good bit of time you know, taking down adhesions. I think if you go into that operation with that in mind, um, it's fine to do. Uh, this is a patient in whom we um, read his old operative note from his previous surgeries and recognized that he had had elements of the posterior abdominal wall uh, 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 separated for his repair. What was done was the posterior rectus sheath was actually divided. This side's a little bit easier to see. You can actually see a clip kind of on both sides. They divided the posterior rectus sheath and actually flipped it outward leaving it attached to the linea alba to use as a fascial closure method for the midline. So kind of a trap door method. And so recognizing that, I knew that on the right rectus abdominis muscle that the posterior sheath was lost. And when I looked at that, and we looked at, at this portion here, we had some concerns. Number one, this is actually a loop of bowel right here. And if you follow this loop, it actually heads all the way downstream to the left-hand side and comes out as his ostomy. And so uh, about 15 centimeters upstream from his stoma is an area where the bowel is pretty plastered to the abdominal wall. Number two, we then saw this loop right here. And when you follow this loop, this is actually his duodenum. So for reasons entirely unclear to me, his duodenum comes out of the retroperitoneum and is actually stuck to the right rectus abdominis muscle with no fat plane. And then this, this Goomba right here is his gallbladder which is also pretty heavily stuck. And so if you go ch charging into this area, not paying too much attention, you're gonna jack up the bowel that leads to his stoma, you're gonna injure his duodenum, and you're gonna wind up doing a cholecystectomy on him. And I did not want any of those things. And so when we went into this, we went in with a plan that all of that was gonna be done with exceptional care and really, really slowly. And this is us about 50% of the way taking this down. Down. This is the loop of bowel that comes up to the stoma, which is almost down. His duodenum is actually part of this here. And you can see how dense the inflammatory response is in this area as we're chipping this stuff off. It took about an hour to get all that stuff down uh, safely. Um, finally, you know, are we going to be able to close the fascia on this patient? Um, or is this going to be a bridged repair? Again, that informs the discussion that I have with patients about what kind of mesh we're going to use. Um, finally, I'm going to conclude with some stuff that um, none of us do very well, but I think really does represent the future of how we're going to use imaging for predictive stuff. All of that stuff, I think, are things that you can learn to look at right now and implement in your practice. 
you, you look at the scan, you make a plan, you go to the operating room, you use those films in the operation. And when you're done, if you go back and look at those films again and say, where did I have challenges and problems? You can learn to do all those things that I just showed you. Radiomics is a little bit different. Radiomics is using information contained in the imaging through additional software processing to determine um, information that you would not able to be, you know, to look at with your eyes and understand anatomically. Okay, so we're uncovering diseases and characteristics that are not available by other diagnostic methods. These use computer algorithms to do things like look at the intra-abdominal fat content versus the subcutaneous fat content. Okay, this is a person who looks like they may have, for example, metabolic syndrome. Um, in image D here, we are looking at the fat density in the spleen and the liver to determine whether this patient has NASH. And if they have NASH, does that lead to a difference in hernia-related outcomes? So the question ultimately is, can, can imaging utilizing radiomics predict outcome? And this is some work done by a, a master's student who works here with me named Anna Sinsago, and some of this stuff is available, and more of it is coming out. So Anna looked at a lot of our hernia patients undergoing open hernia repairs and looked retrospectively at the pre-op scan and then compared that to the post-operative outcome to determine what NASH was capable of predicting. So if you have NASH on your imaging studies and no other diagnosis of diabetes, we know that you are more likely to have post-operative hyperglycemia after your open hernia repair. And that steatosis was independently predicted um, of surgical site occurrences. And so again, if I know that somebody has steatosis and NASH based on their imaging, number one, they're going to be on our aggressive glucose regimen post-op to manage their post-op hyperglycemia with, an, with a plan to uh, change their surgical outcomes. Number two, we looked at adiposity. And we know that if you have adiposity based off of your imaging studies, including the fat distribution, and if you're a type 2 diabetic, that is predictive of surgical site occurrences and surgical site occurrences that require a procedural intervention. So for example, if you were type 2 diabetic and had fatty infiltration of your liver, as opposed to having neither of those things, you were 11 times more likely to develop a surgical site occurrence and 42 times more likely to have that surgical side occurrence require a procedural intervention. So again, does this change the repair that you do? You know, not necessarily, but it can influence the discussion you have with the patient and can it may cause you to manage them differently in the perioperative period. What about the ability to um, prioritize hernia patients in terms of the timing of the repair? Well, you can actually look at imaging studies for the odds ratio of emergency uh, repair. So um, some of this is clinical data, like, the, like whether they have a, a high BMI. Some of it is based off of imaging, like ascites and the sac height. And then if you look at the angle at which the hernia sac comes off the abdominal wall, and if that sac is 30 to 7 degrees or if the sac is less than 30 degrees. So here's a patient with a, a big sac and a really short angle, so they're getting five points. And if you add all these points up, you can actually calculate an odds ratio of needing emergency surgery. Scores of less than five, very low risk. Scores of greater than 10, 2.5 times the odds ratio of needing a repair. This is probably somebody that you wanna potentially move to the front of the line for a repair so that you're doing it electively rather than emergently. So I'll conclude with two more uh, Rembrandt slides here. So, uh, you know, this is a drawing from early in Rembrandt's career. This is beggars in the temple. This is the same drawing, same subject matter much later in his career, just sort of showing that as you get better at looking at this, you can see the same subject matter with a lot more detail. Um, what I thought I would do until Ramana tells me to stop is to basically go through some scans here and just kind of put some of the things that I just talked to into practice. Um, these are some videos that I sometimes use. To be honest, I just kind of stick them all in slide decks. I, I don't look at them ahead of time. So even though I've seen them, I realize that I've looked at thousands of scans in between. And so I am kind of reading these a little bit blind and a little bit on the fly here. Um, if that's okay with you guys, we'll go through a few of them again. Just tell me when you want me to stop, okay? This is a patient who had a prior component separation. And so um, let's 
scroll through here and we'll see you know what we see so as i come down through the first step I, I i usually look for is i usually go through and look at the midline and already in the midline here there's some abnormal stuff going on because i see loss of muscle mass and i don't obviously see clear rectus muscles on either side so we're going to scroll down through and as i do that i now start to see rectus muscles coming back together the left side rectus looks reasonably normal I do see a gap here between the right side of rectus muscle, and I'm seeing a lot of denervation here on this rectus muscle. I see a posterior sheath, and I see an anterior sheath, but I've lost a lot of muscle mass. So I'm suspecting that there's gonna be something going on in the lateral to the rectus here causing a denervation injury. As I scroll down through here, again, I still see that denervation of the right rectus. It's just not here. The diastasis becomes a little bit less I see a little bit of denervation of the right rectus. And I'm also now seeing this plane on top of the rectus muscles that extends out to about here, which again, this makes me think that this is probably an onlay piece of mesh covering something going on. You know, the mesh is a little bit off center. It kind of stops, gosh, maybe, maybe here-ish. It clearly goes a little farther toward the right than it does to the, to the left. So it's a little bit of an off-centered hernia repair. Looks like the bottom end of the mesh is right about here as I come down through the midline. Bottom end of the mesh from this spot down, it looks a little more normal. Rectus muscle has a little more tone here. Uh, still not quite as good as the contralateral side. Um, midline back together, but now, now we're starting to see some additional problems. Posterior rectus sheath appears to have a disruption on the right, on the right hand side here. I've got some loops of bowel that come through a defect in the posterior sheath and that go up here as an intraparietal hernia. So here's a loop of bowel trapped between the rectus abdominis itself and the posterior rectus sheath here. Let's come all the way down through the midline. Rest of the midline looks okay. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the side that's gonna be easier. I'm gonna look at the left-hand side and I'm gonna basically focus my attention from the edge of that rectus muscle all the way across. So this is now, now that I followed it up, I can actually see there's the rectus muscle here and gosh, it just kind of goes away. Here's rectus and midline here. So that rectus is really pulled off the midline. And so when I see that, I mean, this is the rectus abdominis here. Here's the transversus inserting on the costal margin. What I see here is a big gap between the rectus. And I can tell you, this is gonna be a challenge to repair because we know that this gap which uh, I can't measure on this video, but it's a sizable gap and it's in the immediate sub xiphoid window. You can release all the components that you want. You're not gonna be able to pull this costal margin over. And so as I look at this, I begin to get concerned that this area is going to be a bridged portion of this repair without the ability to bring the fascia or the muscle back together. And so as I start thinking about this, I'm thinking that this is a person who I'm gonna talk with the possibility of heavyweight mesh as we move through, okay? Let's come down the rest of that left-hand side here and look, you know, the rest of that rectus, it, it doesn't look too bad. Um, we do lose the posterior rectus sheath though right there. If you look, that spigalian type problem we see on the right is mirrored here on the left-hand side. Look at that, look at that rectus, the posterior sheath, it just kind of vanishes, it kind of vanishes. And so there's gonna be some sort of defect in that left-sided sheath, even though there's no bowel trapped there as well. Okay, but the rest of that left side looks okay. The lateral muscles look okay. Transversus, internal oblique, external oblique, no injuries to the semilunar line. Let's go back and do the same maneuvers now on the right-hand side. Let's go all the way up top. Actually, let's start at the bottom because the abdominal wall is not too bad on the bottom here. Let's follow that rectus up. So I'm just looking at the rectus. You know, it looks reasonably normal in its um, innervation. Again, though, if you compare very subtly, the muscle bulk on the left and the right are different. And so even though there's, there's muscle here, there probably is still a component of that denervation injury that we see higher up extending down. Muscle becomes a lot more denervated. Here's that posterior sheath defect. Let's go up more. Now it's a ghost. And as we head up more, what do we see here? There's something clearly abnormal going on. Let's pause it right here. So what I'm seeing now is um, another intraparietal defect. I see a gap in this uh, denervated rectus. This is rectus muscle here and here, and there's a gap, and there's colon, it looks like, going up. And that colon is trapped either below the external oblique aponeurosis here, 
or potentially trapped below the mesh that covers this. And so this is a true intraparietal defect here that extends all the way up top through this kind of ghost of a rectus muscle. And again, as we get up top here, this is the rectus. It's denervated all the way up top here through. Here's denervated rectus. Here's a widened midline hernia versus diastasis to a rectus on this side. So there's on the right-hand side, there are several intraparietal defects with bowel uh, trapped. Let's look at the lateral musculature now. And again, since it's kind of goofy here, let's go all the way to the bottom. And let's just follow the lateral muscles and let's keep an eye on the semilunar line as we head upward. And let's take a look. So the rectus muscle, the lateral muscles look okay. Again, we've got mesh, external oblique, transversus, and internal oblique. And as I look at this section of the scan right now, one of the things that I notice is, let's follow the medial extent of this external oblique muscle. And let's realize that that external oblique muscle seemingly stops right about here. Certainly the internal oblique muscle extends more toward the midline. And the transversus extends all the way behind the body of the rectus uh, as it should normally do. Let's look at this and let's draw a line between where this external oblique is and let's just cross the midline and say, hey, you know what? On the contralateral side, that external oblique not only comes a lot more medial, but still inserts on the rectus right here. And if you look at it, it's very flat and not particularly balled up. And over here, it's a lot more, it's a lot thicker and a lot more balled up. This is a suggestion to me that this person had a, an external oblique release done unilaterally. If they intended to do both sides, they didn't do it on the left-hand side. So regardless of what the op note says, they definitely didn't do it. If we follow this semilunar line all up and all the way down, we're gonna see that the external oblique still inserts here. On this side, it does not. Now they appropriately covered this with mesh, okay? So let's follow this area back up because there's that, there's that hernia up here. And we wanna now look at this and say, gosh, is that a full thickness semilunar line injury or is it that defect in the posterior rectus sheath going through the muscle itself? So let's follow this up and let's take a look and see where's the semilunar line, it's right here. So this hernia that we already looked at actually happens medial to the semilunar line. So the semilunar line is intact. The uh, internal oblique inserts here still, there's mesh over this. So that hernia that we looked at is truly through the rectus muscle itself. Let's keep going up and let's look right here. Okay, we've got a problem right here that is clearly not on the other side. And let's put that in context of what we already discussed. We know that there's some rectus muscle here and here. This is bowel herniating through it and trapped. Uh, we know that there's mesh here and that this is the external oblique on the costal margin. Here's external oblique above the, above the costal margin. There's something wrong right here. And, and what looks like it's wrong is that the internal oblique insertion is actually injured right here. And you've got some fat content herniating above the costal margin and outward. So the internal oblique insertion point and the transversus insertion point here are missing. Here's the transversus. It should be here behind the rectus and it's gone. So there is actually a partial thickness injury to the semilunar line much higher up. So this person's entire right-hand side is a series of complex, you know, full thickness and partial thickness defects that are um, all of likely related to some component separation operation, okay? And I, I think what you need to understand by looking at this is you're, you're gonna need to do a sublay repair that extends extremely widely above and below and lateral to all of these defects. There's some stuff happening on the left that's really not nearly as complex. There's not a lot of midline stuff either. Um, and in the upper abdomen, you may or may not be able to close this defect entirely, okay? So challenging series of complex, um, complex injuries to the, uh, to the contralateral side. Now I can see Dr. Chowdhury watching here, and I know that he wants to comment that this, this is a, a big abnormal uterus. There's a bunch of other stuff going on here that bears a discussion because if you ignore the fact that there's a uterine lesion here, you know, you're going to fix this, and then a few months later, this person needs their uterus taken out. So there's other important stuff that your radiologist is going to read on this film. Um, that is related to your repair, but not the primary things that you're thinking about, you know, when you look at this, okay? Let's do another. Uh, this is a patient who uh, has a right inguinal hernia, okay? 
And so again, I'm gonna do a very quick review of the midline. I'm just looking to see what's going on. So there's an umbilical defect right there. I like to note if there are umbilical hernias in my inguinal hernia patients. Again, um, I'm, I'm a person who does TAPP repairs. I generally use that to get in. In an era of robotics where ports are placed higher above the umbilicus, uh, you have to think about how am I gonna fix that? If I put a port above this, um, am I gonna do that as a separate you know, kind of fourth incision or what am I gonna do to manage that? Um, part of one of the reasons why I still like doing lap repairs. So um, no, no ventral defects beyond that small umbilical. Now, one of the things I'm noticing here as we get down to the bottom part of this is well above the inguinal canal, I already see bowel uh, outside the abdominal confines. And as I'm looking at this, this has some of the hallmarks of a spagalian hernia, right? I've got a line here, which is the external oblique. I've got internal oblique and transversus here, and I've got some bowel trapped um, in this area. And uh, this is a person whose inguinal hernia was deemed to be irreducible, which is why they were urgently imaged. As we scroll down a little bit, we can actually see here is the, here's the defect. It's a much lower defect here. And I'm gonna do the stuff that Dr. Chaudhry pointed out on the MRI. This happens to be a contrast enhanced study, which makes the uh, epigastric vessels very easy to find. And so let's look for that crescent sign that he talked about. Here is, here is the crescent sign of the epigastric vessels coming from their origin. Here's the artery and the vein and the lymphatic space. And let's follow those as they head up to the abdominal wall here to become the uh, epigastrics. We see content, and if we look at that content, the content of this is coming out lateral to those epigastrics, okay? Content arches over and it comes out lateral. So this has elements that make it look like an indirect hernia. But let's follow the content now. We already know it goes upward on the abdominal wall, which is kind of characteristic of a spagalian type defect. But as we follow this down, we also see content that extends below and actually comes down into the inguinal canal as well. I didn't do the metrics here, but if you do that, if you do that pubic tubercle stuff that we showed, you're going to see there's some fat content here, and you also have some bowel content at this level. This is a defect that I, we don't characterize very well. This is a, a spagalian type uh, inguinal hernia. Okay, there are these folks who have a very low insertion of the arcuate line. And these are things that are kind of halfway between a spagalian and an inguinal. You will see contact that, that does come out through the, um, in, it goes through the internal ring uh, and comes out as a uh, indirect hernia. You'll sometimes see content that only goes up above the external oblique. And sometimes you'll see content that tracks down into the inguinal canal. And sometimes you'll see both of those. The bottom line is, is um, you can, this is very easily treatable laparoscopically because the repair for a low arcuate line hernia and an inguinal hernia are essentially the same operation. You just start your flap a little bit higher and this is a great person to manage laparoscopically. The problem comes in if you approach this via an open repair only and you neglect the fact that there's a big hernia sac that extends up to the abdominal wall or you don't extend your incision that direction, you're gonna wind up being really, really confused. So this is an area where getting an image of an inguinal patient, especially if it's irreducible, might influence and change your understanding of the operation and how you plan the repair. Um, this person also has maybe a small amount of fat with the round ligament on the contralateral side uh, as well, okay? Um, we did a component, let's skip that one. Um, here's a patient who's had multiple prior hernia repairs um, from an outside facility. And again, let's just scroll through and let's do this stuff. So again, we're gonna start looking at the midline. So I'm coming down through the midline, hernia in the midline, okay? Hernia in the midline. Here is some radiopaque fixation in the midline, likely suggestive of mesh in the midline. And there we see the mesh as visualized by, a, 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 there's fat on both sides of the mesh. We see a, a very non-anatomic wrinkle here. And again, we see radiopaque fixation. Let's come down again. Again, there's the edge of the mesh right there. We can see it because this mesh is, is reasonably dense. This does not have um, EPTFE in it. It's not bright white, but it is dense enough and we've got fat density on both sides that we can see it. So we've got hernias that are recurrent in the midline. And one of the things that I just noticed is we just jumped 
from one piece of mesh to the next, okay? If you think about mesh and how most of us fixate it, we, we generally do an outer, I mean, at a minimum, we're gonna do a ring of, of fixation on the outside, right? So if I don't have it on this set of images, but if we go to the coronal images, you can actually um, go from front to back of the patient and you can actually make the circle of mesh. And so we're looking for intersecting circles to see where there's one mesh versus a second mesh. So let's just draw that in our mind and realize that this section right here, here's the apex of one mesh. And so the tacks are gonna go out left and right and they're gonna come back together in the middle at the bottom. So here's the bottom of that first piece of mesh. But now here is another, here's, here's another cluster of tacks and they start to go out. So here's another piece of mesh in the middle. Let's just keep following that midline, pay no attention to the lateral hernia that you're looking at. And here we see a piece of mesh that comes down and ends about here. So there's at least two pieces of mesh in the midline, okay, at least two. Um, now let's look at the, let's do the left-hand side first. Let's go all the way up. We'll begin here. We're looking at muscle itself in the semi-lunar line. The muscle belly itself looks good. Semi-lunar line looks good. Okay, now we got a problem because we have a large amount of fat between the external oblique here, the internal oblique and the transversus. And so this has to be herniating somewhere. So we've got a spagalian type hernia here starting somewhere else. So let's follow that down. Um, abdominal wall is still intact. Good bit of fat up there though. Where's the hole? There's more mesh here. So there's more tax at this level. And so I probably have yeah. another here and I've got bowel. So there's the hole right there. And as I look at this level, this mesh right here, tack, mesh, tack, this was probably supposed to be covering this area. And that's separate from this piece of mesh that we already decided is the second piece of mesh in the low midline. So let's follow that down. I'm coming down. There's that mesh there. There's some colon going up. And then is this one piece of mesh? So look, here's a piece of mesh right here. Let's look at that mesh. That mesh goes there and there. And then I've got another piece of mesh. So I have two pieces of mesh intended to cover this spagalian type hernia on the left-hand side. So now I've got four pieces of mesh in the abdominal wall. All with, they all appear to be the same density and they all appear to be uh, using the same type of mesh fixation, okay? And that's some colon going up there and probably some pericolonic fat. Let's finish that left-hand side and come down. That actually looks okay. And notice the, the, um, the innervation of this rectus looks pretty good all the way down. Even though there's an injury to the semilunar line, only at the very bottom here do we really have um, any evidence of denervation because that, that injury is very, very low. So the majority of the nerves so that rectus are intact. Now let's go up and let's do the right-hand side now. So the right-hand side here, the rectus is intact. The patient has some clips here in the gallbladder fossa. And so um, this is actually a pretty small hole. And um, this is actually uh, one of the patient's laparoscopic trocar sites. So this is a trocar site hernia. Why did they get it? Well, because it was a 12 port that was put through directly through the semilunar line. So this is an injury to the semilunar line from a laparoscopic port. And if you look at this, look at the external oblique. External oblique compared to the contralateral side almost shows evidence of a component separation, which this patient actually did not have. This is just what happens if that external oblique is disinserted. Um, here is uh, a hernia, uh, the fascia is gone, and we've got some colon and probably some small bowel trapped up here as well. But honestly, not a very big defect, but right at the semilunar line, so a semilunar line injury. Um, let's see if the rectus on that side is denervated. You know, honestly, it's not, not that bad, um, despite the fact that it's a pretty big injury. There's no mesh over here, no mesh on that side, so nobody has ever attempted a repair of this, okay? So we've got right-sided injury to the semilunar line. We've got multiple midline defects with recurrent hernias, multiple pieces of mesh with repaired hernias, and then multiple pieces of mesh with a recurrent low right-sided spagal I'm sorry, left-sided spagalian type hernia. Okay. Uh, for me, because I fixed this lady, this is an open repair all day long because you've got to get high in the left upper abdomen or right upper abdomen under the costal margin. You've got to get low and cover the myopectineal orifice, and all of this mesh just needs to come out. And so, uh, a challenging open repair. Um, this is the slide I added uh, just before I gave the talk based on something that Dr. Chaudhary said about post-operative bleeding. 
this is a patient of mine that I, I did, uh, gosh, maybe three weeks ago now. Um, he is a patient who had a, a liver transplant. He's 36. He had a liver transplant for alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, he uh, had a severe hepatic artery stenosis and required anticoagulation for that. Um, he actually bled uh, postoperatively and had to go back after his liver transplant for early postoperative bleeding um, that resulted in the stenosis. Um, he then had a sleeve gastrectomy for morbid obesity. He bled postoperative after his sleeve as a result of his anticoagulation. He had an extremely large intraperitoneal hematoma and he had to go back. He had an open abdomen and was washed out several times prior to closure. Um, I then saw him, he had a midline and a lateral defect, lateral defect from the transplant on the right-hand side, midline defect from the X-lapse for bleeding after his sleeve, and I did a tar on him. I kept him in-house for a long period of time, you know, knowing that he had had two issues with early post-operative bleeding. We kept him, we made him fully anticoagulated before we discharged him home. Um, he got his Coumadin uh, dose checked uh, on post-op day, uh, post-discharge day one, and was told by the clinic to take half of his dose because they were concerned about the rise in his INR, and he inadvertently took twice the dose instead of half of the dose. Um, he then, uh, within 24 hours, uh, had pain, uh, had syncopal episodes at home, and presented to an outside hospital with, uh, with this CT scan. So I added this because I wanted you to see what Dr. Chowdhury was speaking about on a CT scan, which is that you can, when there's acute bleeding, you can see the layering and the layering density between clot and things that are more simple fluid that have not clotted yet. You can also see on this patient a small area of some active extravasation um, in the posterior layer here. Uh, where is right here, there's a little area of some, what's being called active extravasation, okay? And again, this is, easy, this is a little bit easier to see because this was a contrast enhanced uh, imaging study. So um, this guy actually, even though he was having syncopal events, waited at home almost 36 hours before going to the hospital and um, he got stabilized and transferred to us. And I wound up uh, taking him back, even though he was hemodynamically stable, uh, I knew he was going to need to be re-anticoagulated, and he's a transplant patient, and the risk of this thing becoming a gigantic seroma and taking years to resolve weighed on my mind, so I went back. We did, we did a laparoscopic washout of this. We got uh, three and a half liters of clot and other stuff out. We left some drains. We gently re-anticoagulated him, and, and so far, he's been okay, but I'm not pulling the victory card yet because this guy is super nice, but I don't trust him as far as I can throw him to not bleed again. Um, Ramana, how many more do you want me to do? Uh, I'm only a humble panelist, uh, so I'll leave it to the moderators to decide. Maybe one for the road. All right, uh, let's see what I got here. Uh, okay, let's do this one. This one's good. Um, this patient... Uh, uh, this patient lives in Delaware, which is about two hours from uh, from where I'm located, um, and he, um, he he's a he's a pretty big guy. He got a like a viral URI, and he had some coughing, and he uh, presented to the hospital with some pain and uh, an acute bulge. All right, so let's do the stuff we talked about and just kind of do this uh, section by section. So let's look at the midline. Midline is for the most part intact, okay? Nothing at the umbilicus. Let's look at the right abdominal wall because it looks pretty normal. He's got a rectus. He's got lateral muscles that look pretty normal. No right-sided problem. Let's go and spend some time now looking at this left abdominal wall. Um, what I want to tell you is this, this image is actually after he's already had, um, I don't have his original scan, but he actually already had a posterior lateral thoracotomy to uh, repair this. So this is a post-repair study within which he had a onlay piece of a lighter weight polypropylene used to afford the repair, okay? So let's just pause for a minute here and let's look at the abdominal wall. Here's a rectus abdominis muscle. Here are posterior elements of the abdominal wall. 
and here are anterior elements of the abdominal wall. Let us work under the assumption that this is the external oblique that comes out here. It has some muscle component back here, and that should insert on the rib cage. Let's also recognize that there is a rib here, and if we scroll to the contralateral side, we see no rib. And so this is a hallmark that there, are, there is a bony injury to the abdominal wall because there is downward displacement of the ribs, okay? Um, when we look for injuries that include the bony thorax, we always look for the rib location. He has bowel content coming out of this defect that abuts the rib cage, uh, and that stuff is trapped between the posterior elements of the abdominal wall and the anterior elements of the abdominal wall right here. Let's go up a little bit and let's realize that higher up here on the abdominal wall, we see a similar pattern, albeit a little bit more challenging to uh, interpret. Again, if you look at the ribs and think about what should they look like, we start to see things that look abnormal. I see one rib, two rib, three rib. I see one rib, two rib, three rib. There's a problem here. And again, there's downward displacement of some of the uh, bony elements of the, of the rib cage. He's got spleen that's trying to join the party here coming outward. We see similarly the, the, uh, the displacement of the anterior and the posterior elements of the abdominal wall. And now we start to see elements of denervation. Here's a normal rectus. And here's a rectus that is not normal any longer. It is beginning to be denervated because all of those, uh, because the uh, intermuscular plane has been disrupted and those nerves have been divided. We see bowel content coming through. As I start to get higher up here, what I'm gonna to start to look for and understand is, is there an element of this that includes the diaphragm? So if we look for where the diaphragm is on this, it's gonna be challenging to find. Here's the transversus abdominis. Here's the rib cage here. Here's some bony elements of the abdominal wall here, and there's more bony elements down here. And what I now understand is, you know what? There's a gap here, and this gap is actually between the ribs. So there is an intercostal component to this hernia. What is keeping this thing from being a true hernia is the fact that the diaphragm is intact here. And it's intact because in the old operative report, they actually repaired the diaphragm itself. So there's no diaphragm injury here. Here's the diaphragm intact. They did put some mesh in the abdominal wall. And if you actually look, this is actually the mesh right here. I told you it was a lighter weight polypropylene product. It's these non-anatomic folds and wrinkles that sort of tell you that there's some mesh here. This is the external oblique on the upper portion of the abdominal wall, becoming the latissimus and the serratus where they insert. Again, there's content herniating above them, but those outer elements are intact. And so this hernia has all of the elements of a, a, an entity that is poorly described in the literature, but that is essentially a thoraco-abdominal hernia, okay? It includes elements of the bony chest wall and the soft tissues of the abdominal wall, and is confluent between them. And the hallmarks of this, as we recently described at the, a, uh, the EHS meeting, are the following. In almost all of these patients, in fact, in our series, 100% of them had intact external oblique, uh, both at the abdominal wall component and the chest wall component. So they are all intraparietal hernias. Number two, the posterior elements of the abdominal wall are always disrupted, and that includes the intercostals on the chest wall. So the intercostals will be torn. Eric, can you hear us? I think Eric's screen has just frozen. I think Eric's uh, dropped out of the meeting. And there may be a connectivity issue at his end. Um, it's a connectivity issue, uh, obviously. Yeah, and he's back. Super. Yeah, good. Hey guys, sorry, I got kicked out there. 
Um, so I was just saying that uh, this requires, you know, careful consideration for, um, you know, for reconstruction of the abdominal wall. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I think that's a Zoom telling me I should probably stop talking. Um, with that, I'll be, you know, I'll be happy to answer any questions that, uh, that you guys have. Uh, that, that was an amazing talk, Eric. Thank you so much for that. Um, I especially liked how you went Sherlock on that uh, TAPP case. Uh, that's pretty neat. Uh, I have one question for you. I think in the third uh, to last case, what was the PRS disruption with the interparietal hernia that the patient had in addition to the ACST having gone wrong? Um, uh, so that person actually had division of the posterior elements as part of their... Um, uh, as part of their uh, external oblique release. So somebody had actually divided the posterior elements. You know, we would normally think about doing that at the medial border of the rectus, right? right. We, we, medial border of the rectus, do the dissection outward. Uh, that surgeon had actually just done the division at the midsection of it, just kind of divide it up and down to release it. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it achieves the same fascial release idea, right? If you've got a, a, a fascial band around the rectus and you want to open the circle and extend the muscle medial, we cut it at the medial edge. They had just kind of cut it at the bottom edge, but you'll ultimately achieve the same, you know, idea by breaking the ring of fascia. You can bring the muscle more medial. All right, uh, and that makes sense. Uh, I have a quick question about the use of contrast in your practice for ventral and inguinal hernias. Yeah. So, like, when do I use it? Yeah. So, um, so first off, for almost all of these things, non-contrast is appropriate. Okay. Um, a lot of people come to me with a contrast scan. I mean, it's already been done, and so like I don't argue with it. Um, things that contrast is very helpful for um, uh, post-operative complications. Absolutely, the contrast enhanced scans, both IV and PO, are uh, very helpful. Um, if you are looking for um, fluid collections, things that should not enhance with contrast, like that abscess case that I showed you, if that patient had, had PO and IV contrast you would have absolutely seen a soft tissue mass there that uh, was clearly not the bowel. And so that's part of why that was missed because it was, um, you know, because it was a non-contrast scan. The oral contrast can be helpful if you are looking for the etiology and source of a bowel obstruction. And again, you know, in those circumstances, a lot of patients already come to me with a scan, you know, done at their, um, you know, local facility while they were having an obstruction. And so they already have the contrast and we can sort of look, you know, and scroll through it's, you know, it's pretty uncommon for me to meet somebody in clinic who already has a CT scan and say, I'm going to redo this with contrast for the following reasons. But it definitely happens, you know, every once in a while, um, especially if somebody, if we're concerned about fluid or collections around the mesh, or if we're concerned about the possibility of a fistula based off of the clinical story, those are reasons that we would go back and redo the imaging. Uh, what about a patient that has previously had a surgery for a malignancy? Uh, yeah, again, almost all those folks come to me with their scans in hand, right? Right. And so um, because they get routine surveillance for their malignancy, you know, I, I basically just say, look, whatever they're planning to get for your, your malignancy follow-up is what I need. Um, you know, if the scan's are, uh, maybe a little bit older than it would normally be, like, I don't, I'm not going to make them get a new one because they just have one. But yeah, I mean, as part of routine cancer screenings, do the right scan obviously they can't use a non-con scan and I, I can use the contrast scan. And so, you know, if someone's coming back to see me and they're due for their hernia surveillance CT and it's almost time for their cancer screening, I'll either say, look, just get it when you're going to get it and I'll look at it on the back end or I'm going to order it ahead of time and it, it'll be good for both. All right. I guess that's fine. Um, Abhan, I have a question for you. Uh, through uh, Eric's amazing presentation, there's a lot of terminology, you know, that's uh, being used like ACST, PCST, retroactive repairs and whatnot. Uh, you guys at Global have been doing a lot of advanced uh, abdominal wall reconstruction cases. So do you feel like because the terminology has changed so much over the past few years, the way that these scans are ordered has also changed? Uh, like how easy or difficult has it, has it been for your department to update themselves or what sort of a discussion are you guys having with the surgical teams? Yeah, so basically we would like to discuss with the surgeon when the scan is done, what exactly they're looking for. And we try to give a more objective report depending upon the specifics that they are looking for. Obviously, we have to look at the entire scan, but yes, we try to give a more specific report based on what 
exactly they're looking at in the entire abdominal wall or in recurrent hernias and obviously with the new format that is already in place for the ventral hernias we would make it more objective depending on the m1 m2 l1 l2 classification and stuff like that all right uh, uh, like a little bit of a follow up question to dr adisa you know uh, dr uh, paula i just mentioned that surgeons kind of have an edge uh well at least reading hernia scans because they have immediate feedback in their surgeries and they can, they can go back to what they thought they saw on the scan uh revisit those findings and see if they can see what they actually found on the OR table uh my question would be how uh, would you suggest uh we improve the way we request our scans to further reduce these discrepancies see this is a usual problem uh of for any sub specialty not only the abdominal wall pathologist and therefore uh we i have been teaching all my students all the time that you you have to be a clinical radiologist not a radiologist sitting in the department that's the most important issue so a constant interaction between different departments under radiology is mandatory uh that's one and therefore we should not ever ever report any scan without having a complete clinical data because the important thing which anybody whether the surgeon or a physician who has sent are two as eric very eric talk was stupendous absolutely amazing i am amaz. completely spellbound with that so is your eyes cannot see what your brain doesn't know so unless you have entire data your eyes are not going to see it and therefore it is mandatory for if you see our request forms you can see you can make the round there has to be complete clinical story without that we don't undertake the examination but even after the examination we always have a constant interaction with our referring departments with our surgeons so that does decrease the mistakes to certain extent but sure i fully agree with eric on that the surgeons especially those who are specialized in a particular specialty have a decidedly better advantage over the diagnostic radiologists in identifying and picking up the things all right i, I think that makes sense um Uh, Dr. Ramana, over the past couple of years, we've been having a lot of discussion on uh, our several groups where we talk about reducing our threshold for scanning patients. Like, what's the harm, right? So, uh, in your practice, what sort of a clinical scenario would you not scan the patient in? Simple uh, primary hernias in a non-obese patient. Many inguinal hernias, or if I may say so, most inguinal hernias, I would not. Other than say, that. So you were planning an ETEP for a simple primary ventral hernia. Would you still scan, or would you let go of it? Mm, I typically do for documentation purposes, uh, for academic purposes. But uh, I would totally understand if somebody did a uh, repair of some sort, a minimally invasive or open, uh, in a primary hernia, without uh, the patient being obese. I mean, I think that would be all right. All right. Uh, there's a question from uh, Dr. Sanjay Sonar. Any one of you guys can uh, pick up on this. Uh, can you comment on adhesions on the basis of a CT scan? I th- I think the most appropriate person to answer this question should be Eric. The answer is right. yes, but let I- Eric opine on that. All right. Sure thing. Uh, Eric, can you hear us? Hey, sorry guys, my uh, my partner actually popped in uh, to ask me to uh, review a CT scan with him on a hernia patient. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's good timing. I, I was going to try and sneak it in while while you guys were talking. I apologize. I'm, can somebody repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, so there's a question from uh, uh, one of the attendees on the webinar as to uh, uh, can you comment on adhesions based on CT? Yeah, you know, again, um, as um, as was said previously, you know, your eyes uh, can't, you know, your brain can't see what your eyes, you know. How did you say it? It was it was a good. I was going to write it down, and then I then I got sidetracked. Eyes cannot see what your brain doesn't know. There you go. So uh, you know, so again, like if you already know that somebody had dense adhesional lysis, right, in the op report, or you did the operation yourself, or you know that elements of the abdominal wall were already resected, when you scroll through that scan, you're looking for some of the hallmarks. loss of a fat plane between the abdominal you know uh between the viscera and the abdominal wall itself you guys have all seen the scan of somebody who's got this nice curtain of omentum covering everything and you know you know what even if that stuff is stuck it's not a big deal it's omentum 
And then there's that patient, you know, who's got that scan where the duodenum is being pulled up out of the retroperitoneum and is essentially one with the rectus muscle. And, and then, you know, lots of things in between. You know, you will see areas on scans where you'll see one loop of bowel that kind of comes up to the abdominal wall, everything is clearly free, and there's a focal spot where you say, yeah, like that's going to be an area where there is a band-like adhesion. Um, and so I think that the easiest way to get good at looking at this is to, um, before you start the operation, look at those areas and kind of plot out in your mind. You know, the left side of this is going to be easy because there's a bunch of fat in the left upper abdomen. The right lower quadrant is going to be challenging because there's a bunch of, you know, there's, there's loss of the fat planes there. And then just convince yourself that as you're doing the operation that you're seeing the things that are on the scan. And if you get to a spot where there are a lot of adhesions in the operation, just pause for a minute and stop and look at the scan and kind of solidify the view of what that looks like from your operative view and the scan. And the next time you see it on the scan, you will have that frame of reference, right? Um, it's not always 100% uh, predictable. Um, you know, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, I always use my scans to tell me where I should get into the abdominal cavity, okay? So I, I look at that scan and I say, in this patient, upper midline, eight centimeters below the xiphoid is an area where there's clearly a free fat plane. Okay, so I did that on my, yesterday's patient was a redo, redo peristomal hernia that I did open. And we went 10, it was like 15 centimeters below a xiphoid was an area where there was a clear fat plane to get in. Um, and so we, uh, we opened, we found his mesh, we divided the mesh and immediately below us was not fat, but was actually a loop of small bowel. Well, the thing was that loop of small bowel was completely free. It wasn't attached to anything. And so the reason that there wasn't fat there now versus fat there earlier was that the momentum in the bowel had moved. And so even though we picked a spot that we thought was gonna be safe to get in and there was bowel there, it was still safe to get in because it was either gonna be fat that was stuck or everything is totally free and moving around. So you can make some predictions based off of you know, those, types of, uh, those types of findings. All right. Um, there's another question coming to you from Dr. Dalvi in Bombay. Uh, he's asking about the post-liver uh, transplant uh, retromuscular hematoma case. Um, he's wondering if any other option would have worked apart from TAR, uh, especially with the history of bleeding and because TAR is such an oozy surgery. Um, yeah, I mean, potentially. You know, the problem was he had defects from M1 through M4 in the midline. Uh, he had an L1 on the uh, left-hand side, and he had an L1 and an L4 on the right-hand side. So, I mean, yes, potentially, but it would have been a challenge. You know, again, we, we operate on people who require anticoagulation, including tar-based operations, pretty commonly. And while it is a very raw surface, you know, I, again, most of this is not named vessel bleeding, fortunately, right? These are generally small areas of loose. I mean, we we took extra time during the case to make sure that the um, uh, the the muscle was not bleeding. I typically use uh, fibrin sealant, as I said, to secure the mesh, which has some hemostatic properties. And we manage this anticoagulation as slowly as possible. Um, I've had, you know, I mean, in my career of doing TARS like this, I've had several retromuscular bleeds. Uh, most of them are people who had to go back on high-dose anticoagulation immediately post-op, like heparin drip for a high-risk valve within the first, you know, within the first day, um, a little more likely to bleed. Um, okay. You know, I, unfortunately, I'm a believer that TAR is a good operation for these folks. It's, uh, it's got a very low recurrence rate, um, albeit in this patient, he had a complication that hopefully doesn't affect his long-term recurrence. All right. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, Aparna, uh, have you ever seen a ventral hernia CT and just called the patient back for an MR? This is a question from uh, Dr. Shinde in Nasik. No, no, not really. I think CT does justice to most of ventral hernias in terms of uh, diagnosis. And uh, also because MR will take time to cover if it, he has a recurrent large hernial defects, multiple defects, then to cover the entire abdomen on the MR also takes time. So CT is faster and uh, like I think everybody agrees because uh, we are asked to do more CTs, we are more conversant with uh, 
CT in for inter hernias. All right, uh, same question to you, Eric. Uh, like in the thoraco abdominal hernia case where you said there was lightweight polypropylene at the lower end of the defect, uh, would you have considered the patient for an MR? Uh, say the CT uh, wasn't giving you as much information that you needed. Ah. Uh. You know, I mean, sometimes just knowing that there's mesh in there is enough. So if I have the report that says, you know, mesh was placed, um, that is enough for me to say like, hey, you know, I'm going to have to be cognizant of that fact during the operation. And I think the role where mesh comes in is if people have had operations where they think maybe mesh was used, maybe not. Uh, we don't have the operative note to answer the question definitively, we've got an imaging study that is kind of wishy-washy. And that determination would really potentially alter the plan for surgery. And I guess what I would say is, if you found mesh and said to yourself, I'm not gonna take that out with an MIS approach because it's a big sheet of mesh and there's gonna be a chore, then yeah, maybe in that circumstance, the, the imaging would alter the outcome of what you do, right? You know, as every radiologist will tell you, don't order, I mean, don't order a test or an imaging study. It's not going to affect the ultimate outcome of your plan. And so if knowing the exact location of the mesh changes the plan, then sure, go for it. If it's just to find out, is there mesh there? I probably wouldn't do it for that purpose. There isn't enough value in the scan then. I mean, I don't, I think, I mean, if you already have imaging, no, I don't think it's going to augment the imaging that you have enough. If you don't have any imaging and you're picking your first imaging modality, then sure. I mean, why not get the most bang for the buck and pick an imaging modality that is likely to show you, you know, is there mesh? Where is the mesh? Stuff like that. All right. Uh, there's a follow-up case for your hepatic, a uh, follow-up uh, question for your hepatic transplant case. Uh, what's your uh, uh, practice for leaving drains behind in patients on anticoagulants? For leaving? Uh, drains after a tar. Uh, yeah, I mean, I... I I have, I have never done it, not once. Never left a drain behind? Oh, a, a drain, I'm sorry, I, thought you said, I apologize. I thought you said a greenfield filter. Oh yeah, so I, um, I, I universally leave drains behind after tar and retromuscular operations. If it's a very small, very quick retromuscular operation and I think they're gonna leave within 24 hours, I don't. For my robotic tars, because many of them leave within 24 to 36 hours, I don't. Those operations tend to be a bit less um, oozy in general for a reason that I can't necessarily articulate. You know, we do know that the literature on comparing open and robot TARS um, was a higher incidence of surgical site occurrences, but that, in, that difference in surgical site occurrences was all retromuscular seromas, and that difference was likely related to the difference in drain versus no drain, right? So uh, they were all asymptomatic and didn't require procedural interventions, and so I think it's just a, a, a practice management strategy. Um, I generally leave one after a tar, and I universally take it out before the patient goes home, which is usually like day three is kind of like average discharge right. day, like three and a half. And, and I used to care very greatly how much was coming out. And if it wasn't less than 30 a day for two days, I would leave it. And then I went to 60 for two days. And then I said, uh, what's the difference between 60 and 100? And then I said, no, what if it's more than 100? And now it's kind of like, look, there's not a lot coming out. We know you don't have to leave these things anyway. We got the vast majority of it out. And um, again, when those folks come back on day, day 30 and get a CT scan, very few of them have any retromuscular fluid. And so uh, I think that you probably don't need them. I still do leave them. I, I can't really articulate why, but I'm pretty aggressive about getting them out as well. All right. Uh, Dr. Desai, uh, any comment about 3D reconstruction of the abdominal wall and uh, uh, whether it has any value in the long term? Basically, uh, your, anything which you reconstruct with the Sage coronal or 3D will help you to give more delineation of the anatomy which you're looking at. But trust me, the basic axial imaging is the best imaging to come to the real diagnosis. The rest of them are more on add-on and they help you. Like you have multiple lesions, like say venous angiomas or the papillomas then you can show them better with doing the reconstructions of the, uh, uh, of the 3D reconstructions or a pseudo tumors, which are mimic in the hernias. Yes, that might be useful. But overall, otherwise, any 3D of course helps you in any surgery, any part of the uh, body, especially in the MS case, the same story with the abdomen. All right, I, I think that uh, makes sense. Um, Dr. Amanna, um, would a detailed post-recurrence reporting 
of a CT or an MR have any medical legal repercussions for the primary surgeon? Potentially, yes. Um, but this is probably a, a bigger issue in the US rather than in India. In India, just a recurrence isn't uh, likely to take you to court. Probably uh, leaving a mesh, uh, uh, leaving a mop or something is more liable to do so. Uh, so I really don't think this is that big of an issue, but yes, potentially any complication uh, and uh, damage that has been documented. And I would say things like you've damaged the neurovascular bundles and created uh, a long segment of retrous atrophy. You've gone into the uh, wrong planes and the patient does now come with recurrence. Now that would potentially be uh, territory for lawyers to poach on. You just can't escape it. Um, Eric, Dr. Ramana brought up the US. So the question has to you know, move on to you. Uh, you know, we have a lot of folks who are doing retromuscular operations. We are seeing a lot of component separations uh, done wrong or inappropriately. Um, it, it's a challenging. It's a challenging thing to. I mean, not only to manage, but to talk with patients about. You know the. The, the things that are wrong are, you know, the wrong indications for the procedure, um, the, wrong, um, the wrong patient, non-optimized patients, the wrong modality. You know, the fact that you own a robot does not mean that you should be doing robotic abdominal wall reconstruction. I mean, there's, there's a lot of elements that go into it. My patient from Tuesday this week is a patient who went to her local hospital where a surgeon who is older um, and, but new to, new to that hospital decided to do a component separation on her for a six centimeter midline hernia. Um, he did an open bilateral tar complicated by a colotomy. Um, he put heavyweight mesh in the retromuscular space in the setting of a colotomy. She had a post-operative bleed that led to an infected hematoma that he managed conservatively with a drain. And um, she essentially had an abdominal wall that was rigidized as a consequence of all of this. I, I don't believe that she had an active infection. We looked for one for quite a while, including draining a little bit of fluid that was still around the mesh. But I, I spent all of uh, Monday basically undoing that component separation. We redid the posterior elements release, peeled it off the mesh. We then peeled the mesh off the abdominal wall. And I mean, it came out like a turtle shell. I mean, it was like rock solid hard. And uh, she is, you know, day two and like on day one, she's like, I feel so much better. I mean, I mean, honestly, we spent hours deconstructing her. I mean, it was like, it was, it was a pretty tough operation. And I said to the team, I tell, I'm going to tell you right now that she's going to wake up and say, I feel better because of all of the things that kind of happened that probably shouldn't have happened. So, I mean, the medical legal stuff here, obviously the environment is different and we get, um, we get a lot of lawsuits and stuff that come our way. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty open and honest with patients. If they ask, why do I have a recurrent hernia? Like, what's going on? We talk about doing things differently. I try not to place blame on people because, again, most people are not intentionally harming. Um, every once in a while, I see a pretty egregious error, however. Like, if you're going to dictate that you put tax in the triangle of pain uh, on a patient and then they have chronic pain, I mean, it's kind of indefensible. Yeah, even though they said they placed the tax safely. <laughs> it's, just can I, can it's, just, it's just stupidness. Can I ask a question to Eric? Am I allowed to do that? Ah, absolutely. Yeah. Eric, you showed so many examples of the denervation of the muscles. Uh, the, uh, my understanding is that the neural bundles lie between the internal oblique and the transversalis. And where in which uh, operation, when whether it's the anterior or the posterior component, do you get more damage to the nerves? Because basically the plane is supposed to be a little different. So why are we seeing so many of denervations? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, with either of those operations done correctly, there should be no risk of denervation. You know, a division of the external oblique aponeurosis off of its insertion on the rectus with separation of the external and internal oblique muscles from each other 
should not cross the neuromuscular, the neurovascular plane. Right. Transversus abdominis release done medial to the neurovascular bundles that then jumps into the pretransversalis or preperitoneal plane should be below those. So in either of those operations, if you go too deep the wrong direction toward those bundles, you can injure them. Many of the denervations that I see are a consequence of the in initial incision or incisions of the abdominal wall. So we see them commonly in paramedian incisions, in coker incisions, in transplant incisions. Um, we see them with um, stomas that are formed through the semilunar line or stoma closures that then involve an incision around the, uh, the semilunar line as well. So all, I mean, all of those things can result in denervation. Um, and then occasionally we see denervations from um, injuries like uh, rib fractures, uh, you know, lumbar spine and lumbar disc disease where a nerve is being impinged upon and you have the consequences of that coming out on the abdominal wall. Maybe once every, you know, three to six months, I get somebody in my clinic with a big flank bulge and it's just denervation. And if you look back in their history, they've had a, um, a lumbar spine surgery or a bulging disc that was you know, impinging there for many, many years that has probably resulted in a neuropathy of specific nerves. You know, the, the, the trick to all of this is that we, we, are, we are told that the rectus muscle is a motor unit. And that's true. I mean, I, I can't tell you to contract your left upper rectus muscle, right? Your brain can't do that. They work as a motor unit. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the nerves are not sequential and that you can't denervate the muscle by picking off one nerve. So yes, if I pick off a big nerve in the middle, there's nerves above and nerves below, but that midsection is no longer getting neurovascular signals. And the equivalent of this is you have a right diaphragm and a left diaphragm, and there are two different nerves. I can't tell you to breathe with your left diaphragm only right? But if I cut your left diaphragm, your left phrenic nerve, your left side is going to get completely atrophied while the right side will be totally normal. The rectus muscle is exactly the same. And so we see areas of minor denervation on lots and lots of people where one nerve has been inadvertently injured. Even things as simple as a laparoscopic trocar site, which I've seen from like, um, like some, some GYN procedures where they put trocars kind of at the level of the semilunar line, um, in the low pelvis, you'll see denervation medial to that from those incision sites. Good, thanks. That's perfect. Um, sorry, um, uh, Eric, I have a question for you. Um, how routinely do you use uh, uh, the Valsalva maneuver while doing CT scans uh, for ventral hernias? Yeah, for, for ventrals, I don't because they're pretty easy to see. I think the area where it's much more helpful is in um, Im uh, groin stuff. Uh, and um, usually if I'm going to order that, it's because uh, there's a patient who's come to see me in clinic. There's a discrepancy between the clinical exam and the imaging that they already have, and we need a, like a tiebreaker imaging study. Um, I'll be honest, uh, maybe it's just my patient population. Uh, they, they just can't do it. I mean, they, they can barely do the hold your breath and don't move. Like the hold your breath and don't move and push your hernias out, which by the way, I mean, it hurts to have these things pushed out. And so then you got to lay still. I mean, the images aren't always as nice as you specifically want them to, uh, to be. And so I, I rarely use them. But, but if I'm going to use them, not only will I order it and talk with the radiology folks, but I actually spend a few minutes in clinic and explain to the patient what they are going to do on the table. And basically it's like, I want you to physically push hard to push these hernias out. And yes, it's gonna hurt. And I just need you to suck it up for a few, you know, for the two minutes while you're in the scanner. Right, that sounds great. Um, th there are a lot of questions coming our way. So uh, I I'm not gonna ask you all of them. So I'm just gonna ask you how people can reach out to you. Oh uh, yeah, here. Um, let me uh, in the chat box. I will. Um, I'll put my. Um, I'll put my contact info up there. Honestly, the easiest way: um, tag me on an IHC post, uh, DM me on um, on Twitter. That's that's pretty easy. I'll give you my email address uh, as well here. I'll, so I'll put the, I'll put it in the chat box. And oh, that's perfect. So uh, thank you so much. There were so so many new uh, things that we learned about today, uh, particularly radiomics. Am I saying that right? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're saying it right. Absolutely. But uh, uh, 3D reconstruction, so many uh, different opinions. Uh, and especially it was really important to get, uh, uh, you know, to hear so many experienced voices from the radio imaging side. Uh, because sometimes we just feel a little foolish in a dark room. <laughs> Yep. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Desai, uh, Dr. Aparna Patankar. Uh, thanks so much to our panelists, uh, Dr. Ramanna, uh, Eric Polai, and uh, Charlotte Horn has uh, just left us a little while back. Um, uh, thank you so much for being a part of this talk. And uh, Eric shared his details in the chat box for those of you guys who have questions. Uh, once again, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thanks, Dr. Ramanna. Thank you very much. Thank for you. This great conference. Thank you. Thank you. It was like, great to be a part of this discussion. Yeah. And thanks so much, Ash. Thanks, Ayam. And uh, thank you all. Thank you. Bye, guys.